What's up guys? It's yo boy Omnis and say. Welcome to What if I was reborn as Naruto after Valley of the End fight? Part 1. Like share and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. I found myself standing on water in what looked like a sewer. And I mean exactly that. I was literally standing on top of the water instead of in the water, and my surroundings look like what I would expect from a sewer. Not that I'm all that familiar with one. I took a moment to look around. It looked like a hallway in the sense that there was only one path here. Forward or backward. There was nothing but darkness in one direction, and in the other there was a faint light. An exit maybe. Obviously, I headed towards the light. That darkness back there looked a little too foreboding. I went to take a step in their memories. Foreign ones. A village where people use the rooftops like some type of highway. Four huge heads carved out of stone. Growing up in an orphanage and then a small apartment. Going to the academy to be a ninja. Graduating. Forming a team. Going on missions. A snake. An invasion. Grandfather figure dying. Learning a technique. Returning with a new leader. A teammate going rogue. Chasing after him. A hand through my chest. Darkness. I come back to find myself on my knees. Still on top of the water of course. And the sower is still there. I get back onto my feet and look around again. But with a new perspective this time. I know where I am now. And I have a pretty good idea where that light is coming from. It's definitely not God. And I'm really glad this is a mindscape instead of a real sower. Means that getting out of here is possible. But that would only be the start of my problems, wouldn't it? If those memories are correct, then I am now in the body of Naruto Uzumaki, the main character in an anime I used to watch about a boy living in a world where superhuman ninjas exist. Long story short, some 700 episodes if you count the unimportant stuff. It's a dangerous setting where the weak are subjugated to the whims of the strong, where with enough power or dedication, an individual can become a world-ending threat. The stakes just kept increasing as the story went on, from walking on water and spitting fireballs to launching attacks that can destroy cities. And now I'm in the thick of things as the lead. Did I mention that I personally don't like Naruto. Oh, I don't hate him as a reserved individual. I don't think I could ever feel that emotional over a fictional character, but his character bugged me. Idiotic, loud, unskilled, bad taste in females, and just a bunch of other things. I do understand he was made to appeal to a broad audience, and that the plot required certain things, but I still think he didn't live up to his full potential, which is why I feel that this situation is a big case of karma. I always said that I could do better, and now here I am. Some being out there felt that I should put my money where my mouth is. And I have no choice except to do so because this is my life at stake here. Those memories were simply too vivid, if lacking an emotional attachment to be passed off as my imagination going wild. No, I'm moving forward with the assumption that this whole transmigration deal is legitimate and doing anything against my personal well-being is a big no-no. That also means following the original script is not a good idea. Aspiring to become hokage while making friends everywhere I go is not a bad way to live. It's just not the best way to ensure I continue living. I can't limit my rate of progression to match the blonde. Too many events came about only because Naruto was who he was, and because the creators wanted such to happen. I know very well I lack absurd levels of charisma and willpower. So my path has to reflect my own strengths. I want to serve no, thrive in this insane world. So there, goal established. How do I make it happen? Power. How do I get that? Training and using what I have at my disposal. What do I have? Yuzumaki bloodline which includes large chakra pools, longevity, and vitality. I'm also the container for a tail beast meaning more chakra, more vitality, and whatever unique traits it provides. I have shadow clones. Clones of me that retain memories when they disperse. An extremely useful tool which I plan to take advantage of. My outside knowledge is perhaps my greatest advantage. I can use that to guide my training and decision making. All that is just me personally. I have access to resources like the library, other friendly ninjas, training grounds, and enemies in the future to test myself against. So even though I likely lost my plot armor, I have other things to rely on. Not going to say my goal is guaranteed, but it is also not impossible. Just have to put the effort in and not be afraid to get my hands dirty. If idiot Naruto could become one of the strongest in the Anime, then I will aim for even better. I'll become the best in everything I can be. I'll get the power I need to live my own life. Or die trying. Eventually I decided that I had stalled enough. Even though I probably could, 
I shouldn't stand here and wait until I regain consciousness. Who knows when I will be good enough at meditation to visit with Kurama again. Have to use this opportunity. As I trot along towards the light, I consider what I should say to him. I'm thinking the truth is the best option. Don't want to get caught lying. And he could become my partner someday. It is for the best that we are on the same wavelength going forward. Finally got to the end of the hallway. It leads into a huge chamber where the faint light was coming from. At one end is the gate with the seal on it. The light reaches into the jail somewhat but doesn't illuminate the whole thing. Pretty sure Kurama is in the darkness back there. I head to where I think a safe distance is and sit down. On top of the water. Not sure how much time passes before I hear a voice. He's not shouting, but it is still powerful. So, my jailer decides to grace me with his presence. I won't lie and say that I don't feel some fear. You are not what I expected. Makes sense that he noticed. I do not consider myself to be Naruto, so my appearance reflects that in this mindscape. I still look like an African-American male in his early 20s, and my clothes no doubt would look strange in this world too. I'm guessing that as time goes on and I get familiar with this body. I might start to think of it as mine, meaning my internal image will resemble my physical one. Or maybe it will never change. Don't have any experience with these type of situations, hello Kurama. Going with the plan of showing that I know more than I should. How do you know that name? Volume rose, but not quite a shout yet. He comes forward where I can see him. Glowing red eyes are what I see first. The rest of the head and body follow. A reddish-orange fox with nine tails moving behind it. The ears look like that of a rabbit, and he has human-like hands attached to his front legs. Of course, he is also huge. He towers over me by a large margin. Don't know how big he is, but I think that his eyes are the size of a regular adult's body. With that last question, his aura started to press down on me. I don't have words to describe it. But it feels like gravity increased, and my fight or flight instinct activated. If I had been standing, I probably would have been shaking and maybe collapsed. This is why I sat down to have this conversation. Even then, I have to take a few quick breaths and stabilize myself before I can respond. As you probably guessed, I am not Naruto. The best explanation is that I'm a dimensional traveler who happened to end up in this body. In my previous world, we had methods to look into various worlds. This one was one of many, answering his question and probably the following one. Another world he mused. I know that there are other worlds out there. Father's mother was not from this one. But to think another visitor would end up before me, in my container's body no less. He didn't appear to be talking to me, more like thinking out loud. So I didn't say anything. He twitched refocusing on me. What exactly have you seen of this world? And why are you in this body? Quite a bit actually. The next while was spent relating what I had seen and remembered from the Anaim. The Akatsuki, Abito, Fourth Shinobi War, Madara, Kagaya, Black Setsu, all the important stuff. I also told him how I didn't know how I came to be here, but that I didn't intend to die anytime soon. I have already given some thought to how I will take care of these problems, but I would like to have you as a partner. So, you desire my power as well. I won't lie and say no. You and I working together would put us in a position to avoid some of the worst events that might come about. I admit. And beyond that, I need someone to talk to candidly. You just heard my story of where I come from, and what this world meant to me, and although you may not fully believe me just yet, it has some crazy implications. That goes without saying. He stared. Exactly. All these people around me, Naruto's friends and such, I can't tell them this. Well, I could, but the consequences could be grave. Maybe deadly if they learn I'm not him. I really don't want to test just how strong this body's bonds are with a bunch of train killers. So seeing how I would be hard pressed to keep this from you, I would like to have you as a willing partner. Someone to talk to and strategize with. Someone with whom I could put the mask aside. So what do you say? Kurama just looks at me for a moment before speaking. You are correct, your story is quite overwhelming. I need time to reflect. He turned around to go back to the shadows of the cell. I heard his voice one last time before he fully disappeared. I'll summon you when I have decided. I remain sitting there. It wasn't a yes. But it also wasn't a no. I probably wouldn't have had an immediate response either. Back to planning for the future then. Nothing else to do down here. I wonder what happened to bring me here. Really hope my family doesn't suffer over my disappearance standing across from the Hokage's desk. I can't help but reflect over the past six weeks. I regained consciousness in a hospital room, as expected. The nurses did some last checkups on me and told me that I would be allowed to leave the next day. Before leaving, I went in to visit the other genin that had went on the mission. They were part of the small group that Naruto had considered friends, so appearances had to be kept. Maybe one day I would develop an actual friendship with them. It was during those visits that Jiraiya found me and we went up to the roof to talk. After inquiries about how I was coping with Sasuke's betrayal, he informed me about the training trip, and that we would leave the village in a little over a month. He kept sending me worried looks, but he didn't say what was on his mind. That he was worried about how quiet I was compared to the usual. Since he didn't bring it up, I didn't say anything either, let him come to his own conclusions. 
That was probably the best time for me to have been inserted into the script. Being born as Naruto and actually living in the hostile village would not have been fun for multiple reasons. I'm not an expert on the topic, but having the mind of an adult in the body of a baby sounds like torture. Even more so when the population doesn't like you. I'm also sure that I would not have been able to play the role of a normal orphan either. Would have raised a lot of eyebrows. Even coming in at another point would not have been preferable. I still would have needed an explanation for my shift away from canon Naruto. The event with Mizuki may have counted, but it would not have been enough. Not enough time and not enough trauma. And I also would have had to go through some dangerous moments before I even gained someone like Jiraiya to actually help me get stronger. But now though, I have a lot more freedom. Because I just went through a traumatic experience, I can use that to my advantage. I don't have to act like the loud and excitable child that Naruto was, and that's fine because people will not blame me for it. They'd see a sad child recovering from his best friend abandoning him for another trader. I could then study and train in ways Naruto didn't, and they will just see it as an effort on his part to better himself and bring back Sasuke. A lot of differences in behavior will be justified without me having to say anything. Furthermore, this training trip coming up will provide even more room for me to change, because I will be away from people who knew the old Naruto. I won't have to keep pretending upon my return. The only person who might notice is Jiraiya who I'm not too concerned about because he had barely interacted with me pre-insertion. I just need to make those changes somewhat gradually. So yes, this is a good time to be me. Once the Toad Sage left me alone, I started the plan that I had concocted while in my mindscape. Forming the proper hand seal, I performed my first jutsu in this world. The shadow clone technique. It was weird seeing so many Naruto standing around me. So much orange. But I overcame the horror. They knew the plan, but because I made so many, it fell onto me to split them into groups. Five were sent to the library to learn about chakra theory and application, anatomy and physiology, and history. Only five were sent because I didn't want an overload of pure information assaulting my brain when they dispersed. Those five were henched into random people just to be safe. Thirty clones were sent to training ground three to work on chakra control. They would combine water walking with leaf sticking in order to get the most out of those exercises. One final clone was tasked with finding out where Lee got his weights from and purchasing a set. With the groups assigned, the set of 30 followed me to the training ground while the others went about. By the time I finished warming up, the clone with the weights arrived. I was expecting something like the ones I saw in canon, but was pleasantly surprised instead. The set he bought consisted of a belt with two seals on it that went around the midsection. The instructions that came with it said that sending a pulse of chakra directly into one seal increased the weight on the whole body by one increment. Sending chakra into the other seal undid all the weight. The first level was approximately 15 kilograms, and each increase raised the weight by another 15. Doing the math, once I reached the last level, 10, then I would be carrying an extra 150 kilograms. I was intrigued by the idea but also not looking forward to getting there. The instructions also made it clear that training without the use of chakra would provide the best results. It made sense, work on the base body, and all physical enhancement techniques would see marked improvement. After putting the belt on, I got started. Sprinting until I dropped variations of push-ups and sit-ups, squats, lunges, planks. I pushed the famous Yuzumaki stamina to the limit. Needless to say, I could feel every bit of those extra 15 kilos before I called it quits for that day. Periodically I would create a different set of 30 clones, when all the ones doing chakra control exercises ran out of chakra and dispersed. The clones in the library also dispersed sometime that afternoon, after open hours passed. They were nice enough to come find and warn me before they sent over their memories. The sensation of receiving memories felt odd but not uncomfortable. I suddenly knew stuff that I didn't have to waste time learning. Truly, shadow clones are the best. Except for the weekends during which I rested, the time I had before leaving was spent in that fashion. Wake up, eat breakfast, five clones to the library, 30 on control, spend the morning working on accuracy with kunai and shuriken, and then physical workout. Have lunch, practice tojutsu based from academy books and memories, practice ninjutsu and absorb memories from the library clones. Dinner, watch television and relax, meditate while lying in bed. The weekends were used to acclimate and keep up appearances with the people Naruto was friendly with. Not going to lie, it was hard. Going from a civilian in 21st century America to basically a child soldier, drastic change. At times, it was an honest struggle to keep going. This was the case mainly with the physical training, as I never had to push myself this hard back on earth. But I had to do so now. Having a strong, capable body and later on excellent tojutsu skills was the foundation for my goal of being S ranked by the time the war starts. Beyond that, thoughts of what awaited me if I wasn't strong enough served as potent motivators. Therefore, I pushed myself and the results can speak for themselves. I progressed up to level 4 with the weights. My accuracy with kunai and shuriken improved, chakra control skyrocketed, and with that so did proficiency with the rasengan, substitution, and body flicker. The main ninjutsu that I focused on, I picked up all the chakra theory that was available to me in the library, advanced control exercises that I couldn't use yet, 
but would be beneficial later. Shinobi tactics, plants and poisons, etiquette. Anything that I believe could be useful. That being said, I noticed a lack of fuinjutsu material. Guess they didn't want untrusted amateurs messing around with seals. Common sense, I guess. Anyways, it was a productive month. As the exterior would suggest, the Hokage's office is actually circular. Walls made of some type of earth with a number of large windows across from the entrance. That provide a good view of the village. Along with the few portraits, the only other thing of note is the desk placed in front of the windows. A simple desk that wouldn't look too out of place in a classroom back home. Comes with a stack of books and paperwork as well. All in all, smaller and less decorated than what I would expect out of the personal workplace of a powerful leader. Standing behind and to the left of the desk is Shizun. Dark hair with eyes to match them, fair complexion, and wearing her dark blue kimono with white trimming. White obi around her midsection. Attractive young lady. The only thing detracting from her appearance is the pig in her arms. Fortunately for me, it doesn't stink. At least not from back here. My soon-to-be sole companion, besides Kirama, for the next few years is standing off to the side leaning against the wall with his arms crossed. Dressed in his typical green and red outfit and physically bigger than most people Naruto has seen, he draws the eye, especially with that white hair and the red birthmarks on his face. Makes me wonder how people get those. I know the Inuzuka clan all have some type of marking on their faces. But so did Rin and obviously Jiraiya. Were they just born with them? And what happens with white hair and aging? Does it start graying? Does it stop being spiky? So many questions. Anime creators explain. And finally, the lady in charge. The legendary sucker herself. Tsunade Senju. Last of her clan. Best Mednin alive. Biggest bust this side of the universe. When I was first introduced to her character, I just applauded the Anime for including another attractive female in the cast. Even if it was only a Jinjutsu. She also became another of Naruto's precious people and was pretty strong. All was fine. But later I really gave it some thought. This was a person who left the village for personal reasons and spent the next decade or so drinking and gambling away money she didn't possess. And then all of a sudden, she comes back and is placed as the leader of a militaristic village. Didn't make much sense to me, but I realized that there really weren't better options. No one in Minato's nor Kakashi's generation was strong enough, had the right disposition, and supported enough to be Hokage. That left the two loyal Sanin as the options, and since Jureyo was there to plead his case, he was able to throw Tsunade under the bus. Throw her to the wolves actually, no buses in this place. It worked out for the best from what I saw. Jureyo was able to maintain his spy network while Tsunade became the leader, and help the village in the way of creating better Mednin. If Kanoha started racking up debt behind the scenes well, it couldn't have been that bad, since they never showed it. Currently, she is seated in the only chair in the room behind the desk. Fair skin, blonde hair, brown eyes, diamond-shaped seal on her forehead. Green Hayori over a grey blouse that looked like it needed additional support to contain her breasts. I'm sure Jureya would be the first to volunteer for such a worthy cause. Or maybe he would be on the side for wardrobe malfunction. Those three and I were the only ones present for this send-off, not counting the pig, and the ambu I'm sure was stationed around the room. I had already told Naruto's friends that I would be leaving soon, but not the exact date, so they were probably out doing whatever they do when off camera. No need for drama today. Just this one stop and then the training montage can begin. The village is going to feel different without you around brat. I'm grown thank you. Finally get to enjoy some peace and quiet. Very funny granny. I rolled my eyes. Just make sure you don't gamble away the village's budget while I'm gone. Shizun, keep an eye on her please. Of course, Naruto-kun. Stay safe. She didn't even bother to hide her giggles. Both of us ignored the indignant look on Tsunade's face. I'll try. And thank you for the stuff. You're the best. Gave her the guy-style thumbs up. While I did learn a lot from the library, there were certain things that I was unable to find in there. Stuff like the advanced chakra control techniques that the Med Nin used as well as their healing ninjutsu which I found out was called Iyajutsu. Normally to learn them you had to start the process to become a medical nin like Sakura. But then I realized that I had inside connections. A trip to the Hokage's office and some expressed interest in the healing arts and Tsunade pulled some strings for me. I mainly wanted them for improving my control. But learning ways to heal oneself should always be taken. Ah, you're welcome Naruto-kun. She was smiling now, probably recognizing the joke I was playing and willing to play her part. I'm happy that I could help. I could feel the amusement coming from Jureya and the eye rising in Tsunade. Just leave already. Last favor you're ever getting from me. Arms crossed under her chest while mumbling. Annoying, blonde brats. You're blonde too. I decided to have mercy on her. Thank you. I really do appreciate it. I tried to show her how sincere I was through my eyes and face. That was definitely one thing that Naruto always had, a very expressive face. It seemed to work as her eyes became warmer. I know. Make sure you come back in one piece. 
Maintaining the eye contact, I nodded. I had an idea of what or perhaps whom she was probably seeing in her mind. Jiraiya came around to stand beside me while placing a hand on my shoulder. I'll watch over him Haim. You had better pervert. Was her response to which he just laughed and gave a gesture similar to what I had done with Shizun. We'll be back before you know it. Let's go Naruto. With one last wave goodbye we left. Through the window of course. My first time doing that. It was much faster than going down all those stairs. We ran along the rooftops and hopped down at the gate to be signed out. It didn't take long, probably due to the presence of the Toad Sage, and then we were off. My journey to the top was finally beginning. Two months into the trip, I was always a quiet person growing up. In public that is, at home I could let loose somewhat because I trusted and was familiar with my family. With them I could allow my sarcastic and witty side out. In public, which mostly meant school. I was the quiet and polite kid. I had friends that I talked and joked around with, but with strangers or large crowds I clammed up. Looking back, my introvert nature could be depicted as a bell curve. During my youngest years I was energetic and even bubbly, a little after that, and I entered puberty, bringing with it all that awkwardness, and after surviving that phase, I came into my own and started to interact with people better. I still appreciated my personal time, but I could be engaging when I felt like it. All this comes to mind as I'm doing my cooldown stretches because of the company I've kept since I left the village. That being Jiraiya and Kurama. Even after agreeing to help me Kurama doesn't speak much unless I start a conversation. That leaves Jiraiya as the most talkative person here. And talk he does. About women, tips during and after spas, his books, and even about his past at times. As not just the person helping me grow stronger, but also my only link to human contact, I appreciate his presence. I may like being alone at times but I still need that interpersonal aspect. After leaving, Jiraiya took me to a town where he had a contact, and we stayed there for a while, in a camp a little away from the town. Spent the days training and slept in our tents at night. Ate what we hunted supplemented with stuff we bought. It wasn't too bad. Our daily routine, at least for me, consisted of waking up early for physical training, and practicing with throwing weapons until noon. After that I would take off the weights and spar with Jiraiya. Soon I plan to throw in some variations into those spars, but at the moment we just focus on Tajutsu. The subject after that varied, but we've been covering stealth and tracking recently. All the while my clones are training chakra control and elemental affinities for wind and water. Wind being my natural element and water because I had plans for it. I also didn't neglect my main ninjutsu, the Rasengan, substitution, and body flicker. Using my fresh perspective and outsider knowledge, I plan on pushing the limits of those jutsu, but that comes later. For now, I can do the Rasengan one-handed within two seconds. Much better than using two hands but not quite as fast as I want it to be yet. Less than one second is what I would consider prime. Adding an element would be the next step. The substitution is seeing a lot of progress. No hand seals only takes a fraction of a second to do, and slowly increasing range with it. My clones are the best mediums for the jutsu with them being the same proportions, and having my chakra, and I can replace myself with one almost 20 meters away. With control, chakra usage, and experience being the factors that influence my skill with the jutsu, I can realistically predict even better results in the future. It's going to be one hell of a get out of jail free card. The body flicker has provided less results, but I have ideas in mind. Stuff like increasing the range, speed at which I can use it, and even using that boost in speed for other purposes besides travel. But that won't become a reality anytime soon. Chakra sensing is an odd experience. It's like using a sense that you didn't grow up with so then you didn't have any idea how to interpret what you were picking up. Like a blind man suddenly seeing a shirt and not knowing which color to call it unless someone tells him. Using my knowledge of submarines or bats. I visualize detecting chakra as a sonar device. I would send a pulse, and when it bounced off another source of chakra, it would give me a sense of where it was. This was a method I had been messing around with during the evenings with my free time. Pulsing out my chakra had simply been an extension of dispersing a jinjutsu. Expanding my senses and looking for the feedback had been a matter of practice. Interpretation a matter of experience. Having a clone run a distance off and then slowly walking back had allowed me to get a sense of the maximum range. When I first sense him, I would tell him to stop and then measure how far away he was. 11 meters the first time I did it. A month later and it was about 20 meters. From there when I picked up a ping in the middle of my position and the end of my mental grid, I could deduce that it was about 10 meters away. That gave me a distance and a sense of which direction it was coming from. Not all that useful with how small the range was, but I had hopes it would improve in time. Made me actually envy that Karen girl. And don't even get me started on her chakra chains. I have no way to replicate those. Annoying nags with all the good genes. Back to my sensing. It lacks a great amount of precision. Something I hope to achieve in time. Good thing I already have clones in my rotation to focus on that. That jutsu is a hack. 
Sitting in front of my tent focusing outwards I was able to catch the presence 20 meters out with my eyes closed. Being able to recognize my own clones by now I could infer that it was someone else. My familiarity with Jiraiya's chakra and the sound of his clown footwear told me who it was. When he walked into a little clearing among the trees, I was standing facing him. I'm surprised you returned so early. Didn't take long at all, was my sarcastic greeting. He didn't have much to say. Only took a couple of minutes. Okay? Getting a report from his spy. Getting what I asked for. That should not have occupied him for the four hours he was out. What did he there was an emergency at the hot springs. Required my expertise. Hey hey here. That was one of my guesses. Found out anything important. Well, this one blonde had one of the biggest assets that I have. There he goes again. Best to let him get it out of his system. Don't blame him though. Some of the body proportions in this anime world made flesh were outrageous. I couldn't wait to see them up close. And feel them. Taste as well. And whoa, down boy. Just fantasizing up here. No action to partake in yet. Be patient. These boyish hormones keep taking me on roller coaster rides. It's worse this time around because I know just what I'm missing out on. At least Acne hasn't found its way into this world. I meant the informant. Cutting him off midway from his pantomime of something bouncing. Two somethings. Anything sinister lurking around. A. Hey, nothing too major. Mostly rumors. Here. I got what you asked for. Laying out a storage scroll. He activated it releasing its contents. Some clothes, sandals, and a belt. Naruto had been one of the shortest among his graduating class. The last checkup I had before leaving the hospital said 146 centimeters in height and 40 kilograms in weight. Either due to a normal growth spurt or intensive workouts. I had grown a little since arriving here. A little bit taller and a slight gain in mass. Enough that the number of baggy track suits I had, all in orange, were a little less baggy, and I had to unroll the legs to prevent high waters. They were passable for working out, but not much else. And since I didn't bring any civilian wear, I had nothing else to wear when we passed through any settlements. I didn't feel like putting on a transformation jutsu just to not look fashion blind, so I had Drea purchase some normal stuff while I did my morning training. A couple of black trousers, some white shirts and a light, black jacket, black pair of sandals. Simple things that won't attract too much attention. The belt is for a different purpose. I had progressed to level 7 of the training weights, 7 out of 10. After reaching and adapting to the max level, I would have no way to add more weight to it. It was not like Lee's weights where he just added more when he wanted to. Mine was a work of fuinjutsu. Complicated stuff. My answer to that, having Jiraiya look at it and try to create another seal to use as a training aid. One that had no limits. The new belt would hopefully allow me infinite gains. Retreating into my tent and returning with my own storage scroll. I sealed up the new purchases. Thank you Jiraiya. No problem brat. He responded with one of those smiles, eyes closed. You know, I keep meaning to ask you. But how come you use my name now? Not that I miss the nicknames. Looking away from him, I cast my eyes toward the trees while formulating my reasoning. When I first met you, I didn't really have a good impression of you. You acted all weird, and that was after knocking out the guy who was supposed to teach me. And then you threw me into a deep trench instead of teaching me the summoning jutsu properly. And later you took my money even though you should be loaded. Me calling you pervy sage was just to get back at you for all those things and more. Turning back to his face and taking note of his serious expression, I continued. But then you taught me the Rasengan. Disregarding how much fun it was to hit Kabuto with it. I used that jutsu in so many fights. The last of which being against Sasuke. It was my direct counter to his Chidori. So, although I ended up losing. I can honestly say the Rasengan is what kept me in that fight, and what kept me alive. In a way you saved my life. Calling you by name is the least I could do to give you the recognition you deserve. While I'm at it, I would also like to say thank you for all you've taught me so far. Maintaining eye contact as we were, I was able to see the emotions flick across his face. From seriousness, to slight smile, and then a genuine smile. When he finally spoke, I could hear a little extra in his voice. You're welcome Naruto. We stood there for a moment before he placed a hand on my shoulder. Hey, you still want to get started on learning Fuinjutsu? Of course. I was just waiting on you. That's so. With a laugh he motioned for me to sit. Now where to get started 7.5 months into the trip no longer do I have a sower for a mindscape. No sir. Standing in a clearing, surrounding me is a large forest. Trees and shrubbery, natural greens and browns. Healthy looking. On one end of the forest is a cave leading underground. A huge one at that. The entrance looks like Lady Liberty could walk into it and stretch her arms out and still not touch the edges. Can't make out how far back that cave goes due to light not reaching that far. It would be funny how I don't know my own mind. But Kurama made the executive decisions regarding his adobe. And I can't exactly go visit due to reasons. Back when we first began renovating the gutter this place used to be, I thought the process would be easy. Just imagine a setting and boom. Done. That was not the case. I had to work for it. We had to work for it. 
Kirama and I had to create the environment piecemeal. So, it took weeks of nightly visits to even get this far. And it was far from perfect. We had one tree copied and pasted to form a forest of trees. Same with a shrub. They were all the same and equidistant from each other. The sky was a plain white color. No sun and no clouds. To reflect nighttime in the real world it would get dark in here. Dark yet somehow enough visibility to see each other despite having no moon. We made do. I had my clearing and Kurama had his forest to do whatever within his cave. My clearing was actually the seal. It was inscribed on the ground and kept me from leaving the clearing and Kurama from coming into it. It could actually be seen a prison for me now if I actually lived here. At least my guest likes it better than the actual bars. You're slowly changing. It's quite the strange sight. What? Never seen someone going through an existential crisis before. I laughed. No. My previous containers were never in your unique position. Lucky them. It looks worse than it actually feels. I replied looking down at myself. Over the last couple weeks my mental image had started to shift. Instead of the usual crisp image of me pre-insertion, I looked pixelated. Like someone took a really blurry image. I attributed it to adapting to the body I have now and calling it mine. Not like I had a choice, with all the training I've done so far, I have become quite familiar with my body. My short, boyish body that possessed more power than my young adult one did. More than probably everyone back home. And that's just naturally, not even adding on the usage of chakra reinforcement. That is not the only aspect in which you have changed. You are becoming more powerful every day. He smiled with a mouthful of sharp teeth. Combine that with my power, and we shall annihilate that wretched Achiha. You already know I'm down for that. What do you think of the Aerostep? Give it a name that makes sense. It also has no destructive power. Complete the elemental Rasengan you told me about, and perhaps you might impress me. Half Kurama. Shem PH. It's not meant to be destructive, just an accessory to my other skills. And the Rasengan variations are put on hold for now. I think this might have some potential. Walking on air might be useful for you humans. A being like me has no need for such frivolities. Wow talk about disrespect. We can't all be like Ikurama. Sometimes a non-flashy technique is all you need. And that thing took me a long time to get down. Time ill spent. I just rolled my eyes. I would think someone who fell victim to a little seal would appreciate the finer things in life. Not that I think my new technique is on the level of such advanced fuenjutsu. The arrow step was basically an extension of chakra control training. You clung to a solid first, then a liquid, the only matter left was gas. Which is what I did. Even if I cheated, compressing atmospheric air down into a packet, I am able to make it physical enough to create a platform to step on. When it becomes battle ready it will allow me a greater degree of maneuverability. Instead of substituting or taking Taking a hit while in the air, I'll be able to move around it. For now, I practice it while tree hopping, running on air platforms instead of tree trunks. For something that basically amounts to air walking, it requires a certain amount of concentration. And this fox is looking down on it. He's lucky I can't go over there and kick his ass. Whatever. I'll show him up some day. I actually came here to talk about the sage and his ninchu idea. That certainly caught his attention, if the way he opened his eyes and raised his head to tower over me was an indication. Why? You humans already have ninjutsu, why are you interested in ninchu as well? Them humans, but not bringing up that debate at the moment. Honestly, I think it could be useful. From what I remember, Ninchu was meant to connect people and allow them to understand each other, right? After giving it some thought, I think it probably allows some degree of sensing emotions. Similar to your negative emotion sensing, but more versatile. You're correct on the first part. And that is an interesting inference regarding my ability. But you still haven't truly explained your interest. You already know you will get that ability when we merge. I do know that. But we won't be able to merge for a while yet. And you can only sense negative emotions. I admit that in this world full of backstabbing, deceit, and conspiracies that your ability is really useful. But not all emotions are negative. With a couple more years before I can use your ability and the fact that it is probably only usable while using your chakra shroud. I think having a more diverse sensing ability is for the best. That's why I am interested in Ninchu. Kirama continued to stare at me for a moment probably hard in thought. Fine. He responded after a long pause. I don't know if it will give you the empathic capabilities you are after, but I can provide you with what I know of it. Father created Ninshu to give people a better understanding of themselves and others. Being the precursor to Chakra it was meant to create an era of peace. By connecting one's spiritual energies to another, they could communicate without words and pray for each other. This lasted until the elder brother fell to his insecurities, and Black Setsu if you are to be believed, and learned to combine his spiritual and physical energies, to create the chakra you all use as weapons today. Spiritual energies. So, this could be labeled a yin release technique. I asked for clarification. Yes, I have to learn to separate the two energies and utilize the yin then. Sounds like I need to put even more emphasis on control then. Maybe break out that scroll Tsune gave me. And more clones. Meditation too. I thought out loud, volume dropping as I got lost in my mind. Yes, you do that. Later. 
I have questions about our last conversation. You said your people don't have any chakra or such. How did they manage to explore the seas, and even space like they did? And how did they sustain such a large population? Guess I can worry about Yin release later. Well, they created these technologies one year into the trip using a locked forearms to propel myself away from my opponent. I mold my chakra upon landing a dozen meters away, I unleash it, a bullet of compressed air covering the distance in fractions of a second. Speeding to the side he dodges it and returns fire with actual fire. I reply with a water bullet. Using the steam screen that ensues, multiple clones pop into existence, with all but four transforming into kunai that fall into my hands. Leaving one clone to spring the trap three accompany me into the air using aerostep. He is usually good at suppressing his presence. But here in this fight where I already had a bead on him, I felt his chakra split into two with the smaller pool going dim, and almost escaping my radar. But I'm Naruto Yuzumaki, the king of using clones. This move wouldn't catch me off guard this close. Two hands shooting out from beneath my clone proved me correct. They barely had time to grasp his legs before a ball of air destroyed them. Standing on my platform, I saw the arms lose form. Mud clone. Sensing his current location, I send the brace of kunai at him, after covering them with air chakra. My clones take off after that to engage in CQC with me trailing behind. Coming out of the quickly dissipating cloud of steam, I see him surrounded by reflected metal. A small cut on his right sleeve and a pair of kunai in hand. Eyes narrow upon seeing my clones but allows them to approach, which they do after arming themselves. What follows next is a fast-paced exchange of sharp weapons, sparking against each other and clones dispersing. They get a few nicks in, a credit to their skill, speed and teamwork, but he gets them all in the end. Even the ones that dropped their transformations and attacked him from his blind spots. Seeing my chance as he finishes off the last clone, I speed forward unleashing a roundhouse kick which he blocks with crossed arms. As he goes skidding back, I push off with a backflip into the air, where I use another arrow step to send myself at him again. This time the punch passes over his previous block and strikes his face, sending his already off-balance form flying. Compressing and vibrating chakra, my feet had scarcely touched the ground before I was firing the next jutsu. A water bullet, one with a twist. Still in motion flying backward, physically dodging was not an option. He could either counter-attack with a jutsu or take the hit. He chose to substitute. The piece of wood cracking and letting off steam as the scalding water hit it proves that he chose wisely. Ignoring that, I slowly gazed around the clearing, sending off radar pulses. Getting a ping to my left I turned that way to see a blur coming my way. I could sense more than see the chakra primed on his left hand. A seal. Probably a chakra restricting one. Past encounters make me aware that I would be a sitting duck. If that hit me on exposed skin, acting quickly, I reached out to my element around me and infused it with my chakra, making it explode outwards and then reeling it in and twisting it while leaping upwards. The burst of wind slowing his charge while the twister that formed wrenched him off his feet, or tried to before he used chakra to cling to the ground, while the dirt and leaves that the wind brought up left him temporarily blinded. I used the wind to rise off the ground and stand atop the small tornado, funneling chakra to keep the twister raging. I began to fire air bullets at him. Seeing this he started sliding around on the ground, as if it were ice in evasive maneuvers. A moment later he brought a hand seal to his mouth. Recognizing the tiger seal, I sent the twister his way while expelling wind attuned chakra from the tenketsu points in my hands and feet, taking off like a discount iron as fast as possible. Even then, I felt the mixing and combustion of air and fire behind me. Finally reaching a safe distance, I cut the flow of chakra and instead form a platform beneath me. Less chakra exhaustive, after allowing the firestorm to die down, I head back down using successive Euro steps. Seeing Jiraiya standing next to Scorched Earth, I speak up before he can. First of all, I'm counting that as another tie. Secondly, what the hell was that? Sorry, didn't look like it. I just instinctively matched wind with fire. You have to admit though, the end product looked very formidable. Yeah, you created a firestorm with me right in the middle of it. You're lucky I made it out in time. Ha ha ha. He actually looked sheepish at that. I can just imagine what Tsunade would do to me if that seriously hurt you. She would have ripped off little Jiraiya and fed it to you. She probably would too. Don't have to sound so enthusiastic about it. Let's head back. Since someone likes throwing around fire so much, we never sparred near a camp when using Jutsu. This session was just another example of why that was a bad idea. Once we arrived, we sat down and broke out the food. It was upon finishing that he began the evaluation. That was a good swar. As always, you made great use of those Jutsu you mastered. And that water bullet variation is coming along nicely. Almost didn't see the heat coming off it until it got too close. I think it is up to your standards for battle use. You kept the pace fast and were relentless while also thinking ahead regarding both your actions and mine. I'm also particularly impressed by how far you've taken your wind affinity. I can tell that last technique wasn't a set jutsu. In summary, no clear mistakes were made on your part. 
and you are ready to face other opponents. I'll have Tuned send us some missions in the area. We might also be able to get them directly from settlements we pass by. Really? About time, been waiting for this. Yes, finally. Chuckling at my fist pump. I had to be sure you could handle yourself. We're not going to be doing any d rank missions out here, and I won't always be there to help. I know, just looking forward to see where I stand in this world. And I need money too. Do you? There hasn't been much to use it on. And even then, you use my money. He deadpanned. I wave that aside, you're filthy rich. I've seen your writing contract. Besides, I need money to buy new clothes, a set of armor and some other things. Planning on moving out of that dingy apartment when we return to. Armor you say? What kind? I'm thinking just a chest plate. Maybe some arm guards. I have some ideas for the latter. I still have my armor from the Shinobi War. But although you're pretty tall for your age I was older and bigger when I was fitted for them. They won't fit you. Jiraiya shrugged apologetically. That's fine. I want my own after all. I have a contact that is pretty good with that sort of thing. We'll go to him to get your armor. Cool. Now if we're done here, it's Friday afternoon meaning my rest period starts now. I'll throw on my civilian clothes and we can go into town. To the hot springs we go. Heh <laughs> heh. Sirius Jiraiya is no longer among us. In this dangerous world full of psychopaths, weird hair colors, and even weirder people, there is one thing that makes it bearable. No, it's not the above average looking women. I still haven't been able to appreciate that properly. The best thing they have here is the hot springs. Natural pools of water heated by the earth itself possessing minerals that soothe the body and mind. As in Yuzumaki and then further compounded by being a Jinchuriki. I heal faster than other people. After a day of working out and shredding muscle fibers, food and a good night's sleep is all I need to bounce back stronger than the day before. A bonus that I've made great use of. At 14 years old, 154 centimeters tall, and cut to find muscles throughout my whole body, I was quite the sight. And as the routine spas with Jiraiya have shown, it wasn't just for appearances. Self-appreciation aside, I didn't have to come to the springs for rejuvenation. Not like those other people. I came here because I can still enjoy it as the warm water tickles at my body. I found it to be calming. It was also a good location for test subjects. After developing and practicing yen release, empathy for months, I got pretty good with it. With myself as the first subject, I analyzed the readings from what it said I was feeling and matched it with an emotion. Hard to put into words, but different emotions had a different color, for lack of a better word. Making myself think of different topics gave me a list of the most frequent emotions. Sadness, happiness, anger, and etc. But even my own emotions got complicated at times, which left me with slight color variations. That felt like a certain emotion, but not quite. For those I just rounded, after having that for a foundation, I took it into the real world. It helped me flesh out the technique further. I saw what it looked like when people were feeling a mixture of two or more emotions. How far some people could shift between emotions. How the readings showed intense emotions. The minute changes when a con was selling their lies. After testing single targets, I moved on to groups. Instead of focusing onto one source, I allowed my senses to simply spread out around me. Empathy was similar yet mostly different compared to my chakra radar. It had a quarter of the maximum range, and it didn't pulse. It simply flowed outwards until it reached the limit. The drawback of letting it out that far was the information became less specific. I could sense overall emotions of those in range, instead of the little fluctuations. Which is what I was doing now while lazing about in the water. The hot springs were small enough, so I got a good reading from everyone present. From the other side of the partition, on the female side, content was the main emotion. In there was curiosity and a little envy. Maybe some interesting gossip was being shared amongst them. The envy was likely from comparing bodies. Not everyone could be blessed the same. I guess. From the few guys on this side I felt mostly content. In Jiraiya's case, crouching on the wall under his chameleon jutsu while peeping, I got content, surprisingly little lust, and a lot of excitement. Jude was probably getting some inspiration for his next book or something. They're pretty well written for basically smut. Letting everyone else fade into the background, I sunk deeper into the water. Soon I would be putting what I'd learned to the test. I had faith in myself, but I couldn't help but worry about the outcome. Over the past year and change, I had focused on getting my strength and speed to their limits. Practiced with throwing weapons and using them in melee. Drilled my tajutsu. Mastered jutsu that could be done swiftly and without hand seals. And then in spars with Jiraiya, I had combined everything into the style of combat that I wanted to have. Striking fast, striking hard, and being efficient. Attacking from blind spots when I can and bringing my overwhelming power to bear when stealth wasn't possible. It was that same efficiency that I feared the outcome of. There would no doubt be killing involved. Matter of fact, I would probably be introduced to it as fast as possible, and it would be the right decision to make. Better to get the first death out of the way in a somewhat safe environment rather than at a critical time. Practical. But was I ready? Ready to take a life? You're not ready. Oh. Hadn't realized I was broadcasting my thoughts like that. But I believe you will get through it and overcome it. From what I've seen of your character, when something happens you adapt. 
You were brought here leaving everything you knew behind yet you did not crumble. You took the situation and made the best of it. If you can do that back then, then you will do so again. You may not be ready. You may even stumble after the act. But you will persevere and come out stronger. That is what I believe. Sitting up straight in the hot water, I nodded. That's right. This was always going to happen. Just going to be another hurdle in our path. Just have to take it with my head high and deal with the consequences. Thank you Kurama. For strengthening my will. Shem PH. Someone had to. I promised myself I would get stronger. This is simply part of that process. I can do this. I can do this and come out stronger. I will do this. I need to. One year into the trip I was right. My first assignment is bandit cleanup. The mission itself did not come from the Hokage. The town council gave it to us when we went to offer our services to them the next day. In fact, they were more than happy to do so. After getting the needed information I could see why. The target was a small tribe of bandits. Tribe because they were a functional, cohesive bunch that moved around the area doing head and runs. Strike here, steal resources, and then move on. The fact that they didn't stay in place and had no confirmed kills is probably what allowed them to continue operating until now. It simply wasn't worth the money it would have taken to hire a team of ninjas to deal with them. And it would have taken ninjas to complete this mission because they had two of their own in the tribe. Likely low-level tune-in from their description. Hence their agreement to hire us. We were capable ninjas but we would do the job for less than what even a minor shinobi village would charge. A win for both sides involved, they get rid of an annoyance, and I get experience and pay. Their terms. Eliminate the two shinobi and bring back the chakra-less grunts to be sentenced and likely executed or imprisoned. Seemed easy enough. I was already in my current work attire which was basically what Kakashi wears. But in black, and without a vest or mask. After checking my weapon pouches and making sure my storage scroll had plenty of ninja wire, I set out. Leaving the town behind, I made my way towards where they were last spotted days ago. I could feel Drea shadowing me about a kilometer behind. I didn't pay him much attention. Leaping through the trees at the pace I had set, it didn't take me long to arrive at a clearing with signs of past activity. Scattered rocks and ash where a fire had been. Indentations in the ground from various feet. They tried, but they weren't successful in wiping away the evidence. Especially the ones that showed in which direction they had left. I followed them on the ground this time, since they were so kind as to leave me a trail. Noon came and went, and I was still in pursuit. After some deliberation, I decided to not stop for a break just yet. It was about a few hours later that I finally got a ping on my radar. Slowing down my pace and paying more attention for scouts, I continued to advance. One and then two small chakra signatures. Small compared to me or even Jiraiya, compared to the others around them. They might as well have been torches amongst candles. Opting to tree hop as I got closer, I caught my first glimpse of them about 70 meters away. Various tents, a fire with something roasting, and people milling about. With no signatures further out, I knew that these 19 people I sensed made up the entirety of the tribe. Finding a good vantage point, I settled down under the chameleon jutsu with some dry rations to eat. Because I planned on using the stealth approach, nighttime would be the best time to attack. Although common sense would dictate to be even more on guard at night, this bunch had no reason to be overly vigilant, so the cover of darkness would suit me well. It's a little past midnight when I made my move. Using empathy one last time to make sure no one in a tent is conscious, I drop down from the tree and sneak towards the sentry at the north side of the camp. From his chakra pool, he is one of the ninjas I'm here to eliminate, and one of the three people wait keeping watch. For obvious reasons, he'd be my first target. Have to give credit where it's due. For someone with no idea that there is a hit on his group, he's taking watch duty very seriously. Sneaking among the trees while keeping an eye on him. I don't detect even a touch of boredom on his face, or any small movements denoting wanting to be elsewhere. A dedicated one then. Too bad it wouldn't save him from me. Waiting for one of his periodic scans where he turns his head to look around. I launch a kunai at him. Dashing behind it, I was presented with the graphic side of the metal tool entering and embedding itself into the side of his head, catching his body and dragging it behind some trees. I use empathy another time. No signs of alertness. Just one more threat left, and I had already memorized which tent was his. Striding quickly yet quietly through the camp, I stopped in front of the designated tent and observed it. Besides the common traps, seals can also be used to ward off trespassers when set up correctly, and they are much more dangerous. Finding none, I enter the tent to find the ninja snoring away. The lighting is poor in here, but I can make out the slash grass headband. Same as what the other one wore, perhaps they deserted together, bracing myself. I reach out with one hand to jerk his chin up, and with the other add a slash to his throat to match the one on his forehead protector. Looking down at his rapidly bleeding out corpse, I can't help but feel some complex emotions over doing the deed. But now isn't the time. There are others to take care of. With that in mind and no more ninjas to potentially sense chakra use anymore, 
I create five clones who leave to carry out their purpose. I dragged out the body and set it down at the center of the encampment. It doesn't take long for my clones to knock out the other sentries along with the sleeping bandits. Upon doing so they bring them to where I stood and began binding their limbs with the wire I brought. Once done, they went back out collecting everything that was of use and storing them into two scrolls. While they did that I went to the trees where I had left the other ninja and returned placing the body on top of the other. Running through hand seals and feeling my chakra respond almost sluggishly. I set the bodies on fire using the great fireball technique. After only ashes remain, I create more clones, one to carry each remaining bandit, and then speed back towards the town. From the first kunai thrown to my departure, less than half an hour had passed. What an eventful night. You did good, were Jiraiya's first words regarding the debrief. Running all night. I had managed to get back by dawn. Leaving the town hall sans bandits and a little bit richer, we had retreated back to our hostel to discuss things. After running all day yesterday, attacking the bandit camp, and then running throughout the night, I was pretty tired. And having shadowed me the whole time so was Jiraiya, but I'd rather get this out of the way than sleep on it. Picking up and following the trail, observing the camp for the best time to attack, and the attack itself were all well done. You did most of it without using chakra. At my nod he continued. I thought so, only noticed it when the clones came out of the tent. Anyways, the only comment I have is to take out all the sentries first next time. You may have known ahead of time that there were only two shinobi and made them a priority, but that may not always be the case. It's best to deal with those on watch, and minimize the chances of the alarm being sounded if something is discovered. Understood. Yes, I'll remember that for next time, I affirmed. Good, that was the only suggestion. Now, his look of concern grew more prominent. How are you feeling about your first kills? I feel like a mess at the moment. An uncomfortable blend of many different emotions. I decided to be as honest as possible. It was easier and harder than I expected it to be. But I'm really happy they didn't ask for the death of the others. Bad enough I had to kill the shinobi, doing the same to what amounted to civilians would have been harder. Naruto as a war veteran and someone who has experienced a lot of what the shinobi world has to offer. I'll be honest with you and say that it gets easier. Not the act of killing but in the way of living with yourself afterwards. You have to find your reason for what you do during missions. For many it's because they were ordered to and it was their duty. For some it's a way to feed their family, and for others, it's to protect their loved ones and their home. My advice to you is to find your own reason for carrying out the tasks in a shinobi's life. A greater purpose to assuage that pain you feel. Recognize that each life you take is precious but that each violent act can play a part in the creation of something better. Do you understand what I'm asking of you? I find myself staring in shock and even some awe at these words. They're surprisingly eloquent compared to other stuff that I've heard Jiraiya say, but it's not a bad philosophy to live to. One that I would do well to take as my own. Not finding the right words at the moment, all I could do was nod. Do that, and I promise that you will be alright. One more thing. Would you say that mission was hard? At the shake of my head in the negative, he continued as expected. I accepted this one to allow you a first experience in taking a life, not to test your combative abilities. I know that you could take on dozens of ninjas of that level easily, even if you hadn't caught them unaware. No, your real test will be more challenging. I will work with Tsune to assign you an A-ranked missing nin, and you will find and defeat him. Understood. I do. I confirmed. This was a pretty big leap but not one that I didn't think I was ready for. It might be my first real fight against someone that wasn't Jiraiya. I say might because I didn't plan on attacking anyone face to face unless I had to. I'm a ninja, it's what we do. No need for stupid banter or letting them figure out how to beat me in a drawn out altercation. We will see how this missing nin fares. I haven't picked one yet so until then we will continue with our normal routine. Think that's all. I'm going to rest for a little bit, and I think you should do the same. I have some time before I have to meet up with my next source so we can stay here for another week. Offering one last pat on the back he went to clean up before retiring to bed. All the while his words of advice bounced around in my head. That week went by peacefully. After that day we checked out and went back to the clearing where we had stayed and set up the camp again. From there the grind continued, physical training in the morning, sparring with Jiraiya, and meditating in the evenings. Those sessions were dedicated to coming to terms with my emotions, and reaffirming my conviction to meeting my goal. The weekend came around again, and I decided it was time I got over myself and stopped acting like a monk. And I had the perfect way to do that. Learning from Jiraiya the ridiculously long chain of hand seals for the anti-pregnancy jutsu, and donning a slight transformation on my face to add a few years, I was ready to go. My appearance now put me in that range where it was hard to discern a specific age. Could be a mature 17 or a youthful 23. And being tall for my age allowed me to pass myself off as a shorter adult. A fact due to the lower than average height of people here compared to Earth. Strolling along the dirt roads, my head was on a swivel. The social scene around here was not what I was used to. No parties where the ladies would congregate. No clubs where they would go to dance and have fun. No social media. With that being the case, 
I chose to go looking for them in the way many of my friends used to. Bar hopping. Walking into the second bar I had found, I struck gold. The first thing I had noticed was her butt squashed atop the stool she sat on near the counter. After that was the long black hair falling to her mid-back, and the intricate kimono she was wearing. I was interested, but I had to see the other side before I could commit. So, I approached her, sitting in the seat beside her and casting a subtle look, I mentally patted myself on the back. Fair complexion and while not having any striking features, she was still a pretty woman. She had reminded me of Shizun with a better butt. But with the hard training Kinochi commit to, it makes sense that you're more likely to find sculpted and powerful figures rather than soft and fleshy. Not that both don't have their benefits. Engaging her with a smile and a compliment on her kimono, I slowly began to chat her up. Learning that she was a seamstress, was celebrating a successful commission, and was single. The flirting ramped up after getting that tidbit. And if her kiss were to be believed, she didn't mind. Empathy backed that up. One last exchange saw us moving to a different venue. Are you sure you want little old me? There are a couple younger girls who would love a handsome young man like yourself. Coquettish smile on her face. Well, personally, I find older women to be so much more entrancing. A sexy, mature body and real confidence in herself. That's what I see in you and that's what I want. Almost whispering in her ear at this point. If you let me, I want to leave with you. To take you somewhere private and please that sinful body. To bring you to heights you'd never imagined. To make you scream my name. You only have to consent. Her cheeks flushed with color as she slowly nodded. We went to her modest home, and I made good on that promise. I never go back on those after all. No finding myself laying in bed with her cuddle to my side still asleep, I was satisfied. Different body in a different world, but the pleasures of sex remained a reliable constant. Although, I don't think I'll experience it too often. This experience shows it's possible to satisfy my bodily urges while on this trip. But since we're not always around civilization, there will be times where I have to tough it out. Just another form of training I guess. After this trip is over and I've dealt with the Akatsuki I can look into starting a relationship of some type. Praying for fortitude because I don't plan on starting anything with anyone in the leaf without first talking to Hanata. Seeing how I'm already using Judy as an excuse to push it off, it's going to be a long time before that conversation and a long while without. It is what it is. One might think I don't owe anything to Hanata, since we never made any promises or even talked about our, her, feelings. But I would feel horrible otherwise. Sleeping with women during the trip is one thing, going back and doing the same where she would be forced to bear with it is another. I'm not going to play the fool. So there is no way to act ignorant of her crush on me without looking and feeling like some kind of jerk. Or a short-sighted teenager. So, don't know what it is I'm going to say. But we have to clear the air somehow. And who knows, maybe starting over as actual friends might lead to something between us. Feeling a shift in the form beside me. I drop that trail of thought and make sure to reapply the transformation. Keeping it up while being busy was hard enough, maintaining the technique while sleeping was impossible. Speaking of jutsu, I think a special thanks should go to the creator of the jutsu I used. If I was back home, I would have had to use a whole box of condoms just during the one night. While here they don't have such protections. The only methods I know of to prevent accidental pregnancy was some tea leaf that women could take at the beginning of their cycle, and the jutsu. The jutsu had a version for females, and a longer one for males. But I think 34 hand seals is an okay trade to having sex bareback. Turning and running my hand over the curve of her hips, I placed a kiss on her forehead. Good morning you are. Mem mem, good morning to you too Naruto-kun. She smiled. How are you feeling on the start of such a beautiful day? Great. Had fun last night. I wouldn't say no to a repeat. Is that what you wanted to hear? She asked with a laugh. Can't a man wonder about the health of his lover? I genuinely care. I replied with mock indignation. I know what you were after. And lover, am I? Yup. I know you loved what we did last night. Someone sure seems confident. She challenged. I know where I stand. And if I didn't, your reactions would have clued me in. I responded with a wink to which she playfully slapped my shoulder. So, what do you have planned for today? I have to open the store soon. Probably in another hour or so. She said glancing out at the rising son right you mentioned that hey do you mind if i hang around and look at your products of course not i would love to show you my wares but you have to buy something though i'll do you one better i replied i want to arrange a commission really she moved around to place her back against the headboard the new position causing her chest to be exposed to the air and of course my eyes fixed onto her girls she only smirked you would trust me with a commission before seeing if i was worth it why not sitting up and giving her my attention above her neck this time based off that kimono you wore yesterday 
You have serious skill, and I want to make use of them. Well, thank you. It's my passion in life. So, what are you looking for? She inquired. A cloak, mainly black with some red thrown in. Should go down to about my knees. I can draw it up later if that would help. I offered. After seeing Naruto in the six-part sage mode, I knew that black and gold was the move. With the wisp of chakra flowing off of him and the truth seeking balls in the back. Badass. I didn't have access to that form and might never, but I can copy the basic idea. Due to that, I already had a color scheme for my future armor, but since I didn't plan on wearing that everywhere, I needed another signature. Thus, the cloak, loosely based on what I remembered him wearing while confronting pain, it would be my go-to. Sounds easy enough. She commented, cool, knew I could rely on you. I have yet to make it flatterer, rolling her eyes, it will probably take a few days. Even longer if you want more than one of them. That's to be expected. And, I definitely want more than one. A couple made with tough fabric for traveling, and then another set for casual wear. I'll be leaving the town soon, but I can come back when they're ready. We can figure out the time frame later. Agreed. Now, I think there's something that we've been neglecting. Her eyes went down to my waistline, where the unobstructed view of her breasts had caused a certain reaction. I can get behind that. Or behind you actually. I affirmed with a grin. Taking the hint for what it was, she pushed the sheets to the side and turned around placing her hands on the headboard. Taking in the view, all I could think of was how lucky I was. Honestly, to meet a good looking woman, who was also a seamstress, and also had this great of an ass. Christmas must have followed me here. What are you waiting for? She asked while giving a little wiggle. Hurry up back there. Where do you want it? I knew what I wanted to try again, but better to let her make the decision. Giving me a heated look over her shoulder, she chewed her bottom lip in thought. Where you ended yesterday? She finally picked. That would be exactly what I had in mind. Though I didn't think she would ask for that herself before getting warmed up. I could definitely work with that though. Grabbing myself with my free hand. I guided it to its destination. A lucky man indeed. Walking into a shared room to applause. I ignore his antics and shut the door behind me. My little boy's a man now, proclaims Jureyo in faux tears. He's went out and had his eyes opened by the wonders of the female persuasion. Pretending to not care about his words externally, I couldn't help but feel accomplished. I crossed that master much earlier in this life than my past one. And who doesn't appreciate a good hype man? I'm so proud of you Naruto. None of my past students took to my teachings as well as you have. Now you can go forth using what I taught you to woo all those lonely hearts throughout the nations. And then you tell me about your adventures to create my next bestseller. Make out paradise. What the heart wants. A man looking for love while roaming the elemental nations. Steamy action galore. The last part is said with his typical laugh. That weird giggle he has going on. Whoa, hold on there. First of all, you didn't teach me to woo anyone. Secondly, if anyone is writing a book about my sex life, it's me. Not some old man, I state. I didn't have to teach you, you picked it up from me just being around me. I'm that good. His chest puffs up. It didn't work that way. I'm just a natural ladies man. Yes, it did. And what do you know about writing fine literature? I have to be the one who writes it. Like I said, I'm a natural. And no one is writing erotica about me except me. Get your own muse. Fine, I'll base it off my experiences. Half Jiraiya, before his tone changed. So, how was it? It was amazing. Mind-blowing. I replied in the same manner. And get this, she's a seamstress. Ha ha ha. That's what I like to hear. He crowed, extending a fist to me. Recognizing what he was after, I reached out and pumped mine with his. This brought up fond memories of my friends. Hope they're having as much fun as I was. Likely more without me there to slow them down. So, you talked to her about that cloak you wanted? Yeah. She agreed to make them, so I gave her the specifics. I'll have to return here in a couple months or so. Good. I don't mind coming back here again. For now, I'm feeling pretty hungry. Want to go to that restaurant across from us? Heard it's good. He asked getting up. Sure, I can eat again. One year six months into the trip flying under your own power is one of the greatest sensations in this world. It's fun, convenient for traveling, and can be the best escape route in a pinch. People here should do it more. Like honestly, if that short Jew from Isla can do it using an earth jutsu, then it shouldn't be that hard to figure out. Of course, in this case when I say flying, I'm actually aero-stepping some kilometers in the air. Running on air platforms is more chakra efficient than my method of ejecting air from my palms and soles, like the late Tony Stark. May he rest in peace. It also allows me the use of my hands for the special binoculars I'd obtained. They allow me to keep a visual on my target whom I'd been trailing for the past couple days. A missing nin from Iowa named Shiroto, no clan affiliation. An A rank with known proficiency in earth and some fire release. He had a bounty of a quarter million Ryo. The reward was decent. But it was not my primary motivation for targeting Shiroto, it was to pass Jiraiya's test. That desire leads to me being even more meticulous in my plan of attack. After leaving the town where Yua lived, we had passed through many other settlements, and sometimes they had something for me to do. Be it carrying a message scroll, seeing to bandit issues, and even being a guard. 
I had carried out a number of missions. A few weeks ago, Jiraiya had finally decided and sent me out to find Shiroto here. Since then, it took me up until two days ago to find his trail, and thus him where I had taken to observing him from above, where the distance would make him unlikely to detect my presence. And now, I would make my entrance. Harming the six kumai I had attached explosive tags to, I cut the flow of chakra beneath me and entered free fall, adjusting my body. I fell towards him going headfirst at an angle, ignoring the wind racing by me. I mentally counted down until I hit the optimal distance. Launching the kunai while leveling out of my descent, I watched the weapons fly toward the rogue ninja. They were not on course to hit him, but that hadn't been my intention in the first place. As soon as they had flown into position around him, I triggered the specially made tags. Boom. Standing firmly outside of the blast radius, I waited patiently for him to reveal himself. His chakra presence was easy to discern even inside the dust and smoke despite how muted it had become. It would seem that he was attempting to play dead. The foreign chakra trying to enter my pathways was further proof. Enough. Flexing my chakra and sending out a gust of air, I dispersed both the Jinjutsu and the smoke cloud. The explosive tags I had used were more akin to pressure grenades than anything else. Sure, it still had the combustion as expected, but the most dangerous aspect of it was the sheer force it packed, enough to rupture blood vessels and harm internal organs in a shinobi of caught unaware. And Shiroto had been caught in the middle of six of them going off, which made the sight before me, as the cloud was swept away both surprising, and then not so. Still in what was ground zero, the missing nin had managed to survive. Down on one knee and bleeding from his visible orifices, there was a certain sheen to his skin that was fading as I watched. Some type of body reinforcement, likely earth-based like Kakuzu's. The fact that he was able to raise his defenses so quickly is commendable. A testament to his abilities. It meant that I would have to personally finish him off. Guess I would be getting that fight after all. I dashed towards him while molding Chakra for a hot water bullet. Seeing me approach, he slammed his palms on the ground after running through some seals, raising an earth wall. Launching my Jutsu, I leapt into the air and above the wall, using consecutive arrow steps which put him in my sight again. Forming a giant Rasengan, I propelled myself off an air platform at him. He jumped away at the last second, causing me to impact the ground, leaving a crater and flying debris. Ignoring that, I body flickered behind his flying body and caught him with a roundhouse to the back, sending him crashing through his earth wall. It felt like I hit a block of metal, he was handy with that defense of his. Going on the offense once again, I reached him after he got back on both feet, and we engaged into Jutsu. It was quickly obvious who was superior in that regard, he was injured which lowered all his physical attributes, while I was still at 100%. His only saving grace was his body armament, with proper warning. He could reinforce his arms to block hits or his critical areas in time to mitigate the blows that landed. Well, if speed was one way to victory, then I had solutions. Deflecting a left hook, I used that hand to grab the back of his neck to introduce his face to a rising knee. Letting him go, I gave him two quick strikes to the midsection, a straight to the nose sending him reeling, and then a wind bullet launching him backwards. Whipping out another kunai, an application of chakra saw it multiplying into half a dozen, that rapidly overtook his flight. This next part required a high level of concentration, but I had practiced it enough to be battle ready. Everything seemed to slow down, my focus only on the airborne ninja and kunai. In a flash, I was off. Three substitutions, three rapid fire strikes. Knife hand to the throat, upward punch to the lumbar bone, resing into the sternum. The last attack saw us in a situation too similar to how we had started, with him in a crater. Except this time, he would not rise again with half his chest shredded. Waiting until the life had left his eyes, I began to clean up. Weakling, that was not a match worth watching, remarked Kurama, breaking the radio silence. It wasn't, but he can hardly be blamed for that. I responded internally, taking out a special storage scroll. I unfold it next to the corpse. Because you attacked while he was unaware, I suppose the credit would go to your proficiency rather than his innate failures. Yeah, I doubt many people expect danger from the heights I can now reach. Very few shinobi can fly. After some maneuvering, the body was sealed away in a puff of smoke. You passed the white head one's test. Will you return to him now? He asked. I'll stop by the nearest bounty office first if it is on the way. And then I'll return. Very well. Don't forget our agreement. His mental presence receding from the forefront. Looking around the clearing one last time. I set off. Couldn't help but think over Kirana's words. That fight had been very easy. After the failed assassination attempt, the now dead missing Nin had been off balance during the rest of the encounter. Overwhelming offense had made it hard for him to get any real attacks in, never mind the fact that he was already injured. Can't really call it a fight, more like a beat down in my favor. And I had no problems with that. Having encounters end that easily is something that I know is unlikely to happen all the time, but I will keep pushing for it. If the possibility for a fatal sneak attack is there, then I can't hesitate to take it. Not with the people I am preparing to fight. People with strong abilities and years worth of experience in combat over me. Of course, I too had a pretty good hand of cards. 
but stacking the deck further in my favor doesn't hurt. Work smarter, not harder is a saying for a reason. Turning in the bounty and getting my reward hadn't taken very long. It was a simple process with none of the annoying bureaucracy that one would have expected. When dealing with such large sums of money, all the better for me I suppose. Leaving the center behind and meeting back up with Jureya. I had presented him with the evidence of my success, and received a pretty lackluster congratulations from him. I found it odd, but a scan of his emotions had revealed a crisis of a sort raging internally. So, I had put my concerns aside for a while, and simply went about the rest of the day silently, after assuming that he would open up whenever he decided to. It was as we were sitting around the campfire that he finally seemed to reach a resolution. Naruto, looking up from my half-eaten deer haunch, I quirked my eyebrows at him. I have something to tell you. You've reached a point in your life where you have the strength and maturity to be privy to this information. Especially since it regards you. Oh, this was looking up to be a very interesting talk. And I think I already knew where this was going. It's about your parents. Called it. Your father was Minato Namikas, the fourth Hokage, and your mother was Kishina Yuzumaki, an envoy from the land of Whirlpools before it was destroyed. She was also the Nine Tails Jinchuriki before you, but that is something that very few people knew. Due to this and the notoriety that your father had gained, they kept their relationship and especially your approaching birth a secret. Not that it helped in the end, the night she gave birth, something happened and the Nine Tails was released. He gained a far off look in his eyes as he looked back to that day. Probably the worst event in Kanoha's history as of yet. It cost him a lot, his student friends, dreams for the future. But being a shinobi meant enduring, and Jureya had. They managed to restrain and seal it into you at the cost of their lives. It was decided after that to keep the identity of your parents a secret to protect you. Both of them had enemies. But Minato was a high-profile shinobi, any links to him would have put you under extra scrutiny. It could have revealed not only that you were his son, but that you were also the current Jinchuriki, which would have raised your threat assessment even higher. I can tell you more about them later, but before anything else, I want you to know that they both loved you. The months before your birth were some of the happiest for the couple, and there was nothing that they wouldn't have done for you. Even sacrificed their lives to save yours. After that spill, he took a breath and looked me directly in the eyes before continuing. I would know that because I was close to your father. Minato was my pupil just as you are now. I saw his family and the same was true for him. He even asked me to a surrogate father to you if anything happened to him. To which I agreed not knowing what was to come. Disaster strikes and he died, leaving you an orphan. And instead of fulfilling my promise, I used my duties and lies about your safety to remain outside the village. All the while drowning my sorrows in drink and women. That is one of my greatest regrets in life. Abandoning you to a village that spurned the sacrifice that Minato made. I told myself that it was safer for you. But in the end, it was me running away from what mattered most. I will understand if you never forgive me. But I want to do right by you. I want T- -dash. I'm going to stop you right there. I said while lowering my hand. There is no point in asking for forgiveness. Jureya, I hold nothing against you. I've been spending some time thinking about the past and the future I want and long story short, a lot of things have changed. My dreams are not what they used to be and the way I approach problems is no longer the same. I'm a different person now with a new perspective on things. So, you can rest assured that I am not going to hate you for leaving all those years ago. You have been a good mentor and a friend to me over the time that we've been together, and I want you to know that. You may not be a father figure to me, but we can still be family as well. So, stop worrying over stuff like that, you're just adding more years to your face. Still catching my look, he let the matter drop. Thank you. You've really grown Naruto. I know. At 23 years old mentally, I would find it pretty offensive to have shown no growth in maturity compared to Naruto. And to be honest, the fourth being my father isn't all that surprising. I had already suspected it after connecting some of the dots. It's the identity of my mother that was harder to pinpoint. Thank you for telling me the truth Jureya. No need to thank me. You had a right to that information and as soon as you were ready, I had no justification for concealing it. And like I said, I knew both of them and can tell you more about their personal lives if you wish. I nodded, I'll take you up on that in the future. After getting that confession of his chest, Jureya seemed to have found his appetite again. I really hoped he took my words to heart. Putting my feelings into words had never been my strong point, but a man has to try his best sometimes. Jureya had quickly became a close friend to me. All the time spent traveling, training, and just conversing together had elevated him to bro status in my eyes. Making sure he doesn't get killed by pain and finding love in Sunade were two things that I hoped my presence here would fix. Jude deserved at least that much. Remembering Kurama's last comment or order basically, I broke the comfortable silence between us. Hey, I plan to start training with the Nine Tails Chakra soon. I said, you finally made up your mind. I remember you saying you wanted to prepare before you messed with that. What can I do to help? He replied, after some suggestions about using Kurama's Chakra. 
I had told him I wanted to train my body and mind beforehand to lower the risks of me going out of control. He had accepted my reasoning back then, and hadn't brought it up again. Hopefully you can provide me with the key to unlock the seal. I've looked at it, and it appears to have limits in place to prevent me from drawing out too much chakra. I could break them myself, but I figured there was probably a safer method, hence a key. There is a key. But do you really have to unlock it fully? He seemed somewhat hesitant while responding. I had planned to loosen it when you started training, but only a little bit. I don't think going that far so fast is safe. I can handle it. Trust me, I wouldn't suggest so otherwise. Seeing his reluctance dimming, I sweetened the deal, and I don't plan to do it just yet. Just wanted to give you advance warning and time to prepare the key if you had it. I was thinking of doing it at the end of this year. Should give me a good amount of time to adapt to it before returning to the village. After deliberating for a while, Jureya sighed. Fine, we can do it then. That should give me more than enough time to arrange some precautions. Cool. Soon. Two years into the trip chakra is a powerful thing with diverse abilities. It is defined as a mixture of physical and spiritual energy that everyone possesses. Some people have their chakra system unlocked while most do not. Those who don't are essentially relegated to the bottom of the food chain. In terms of personal power that is, some of the most influential people in this world are the daimyus, and none are chakra users currently. But their power lies in their wealth and authority. Nothing compared to those who found their chakra systems, and brought that energy to the forefront, unlocking it for personal usage. That is where the real power lies. Enhanced physical abilities both passively and active, clinging to surfaces, a wide range of ninjutsu and jinjutsu. The basic stuff available to every user. Aside from that are abilities gained through mutations of the body and chakra like dejutsus and bloodline limits. But despite the techniques blocked off by genetics or clans guarding them religiously, there are even more that anyone with the requisite chakra control and quantity can use. Some people are fine with specializing in just a few, while others go above and beyond. Hiruzen Saratobi once held the title of God of Shinobi, due to his mastery of the shinobi arts, including all five of the elemental affinities, and all public jutsus from the hidden leaf. Kakashi Hadok is called the Copy Ninja, for having used his Sharingan to copy over a thousand jutsu. Orochimaru of the Sanin is famed for having jutsus from all the main elements as well as several forbidden jutsus. Just those three are great examples of what one can achieve with the right mindset and tool in the case of Kakashi. I happen to have both. I want to learn all the techniques I can and with shadow clones. I can do that faster than most people. Of course. I know that jutsus aren't the end all be all in combat. My style for example relies on the speed and power of my tajutsu complemented by ninjutsu. I've trained to be Hansil free and ninja tools. Why bother standing around matching jutsu for jutsu if I don't have to? That mindset is further compounded by the fact that someday I'll be able to go Super Saiyan and end fights before they start with one serious punch. And I already saw what higher levels of Tajutsu can accomplish from the Madara vs Guy fight. But I also know that it is better to have something and not need it than to have the need, but not the means. There are times when ninjutsu can be quite useful, like defending a stationary object or person. Or perhaps when range is necessary. Or as a method of crowd control. Completely logical reasoning. The fact that I want to be able to use all of the five elements and perhaps learn to combine them in the future is just an afterthought. Long story short, the last several months have been spent training my lightning, fire, and earth affinities to an adequate level to make better use of the techniques that Jureya taught me. Those elements had not been mastered by any means. But that training was paying dividends in chakra economy and proficiency. I may have a lot of chakra available to me, but that is no reason to settle for simply overloading jutsus to make them stronger. Leaving that to my clones, I had personally seen to something more impressive. Completing the Rasengan, twice over since I already had two highly trained affinities. The wind variant took me almost no time, only a couple weeks. Which admittedly felt like a while compared to the seemingly short time period in which Canon Naruto managed to make his. I'd like to think that creating the final product with the wind blades, and also turning it into a ranged technique made up for it. And that was without natural energy stabilizing it for me. Once that box had been checked, I moved on to the water-based Rasengan, in which I had put quite a bit of thought. Water is an essential in life. From plants to animals, it sustains us all. We would all die without it. But it can also be deadly in its own right. Nature itself presents us with displacements of large volumes of water, which can then lead to tsunamis. High and powerful waves that ripple out from the point of disturbance, and are capable of devastating property damage and death to living creatures. In my world, man learned to harness water in the form of firefighter hoses and water hydrants. Anyone who's seen these can attest to the power that they contain. As for this universe, well, water jutsus are created and learned for a reason. What these examples have in common are the large amounts of water needed, along with the high velocities. My idea for achieving that was simple. Create a hollow Rasengan and then fill it with water chakra. That compressed water would then wreak havoc after the shell containing it collapsed. Seemed like a logical thought process. Of course, before even attempting it, a method of delivery had to be chosen. Keeping up with the current theme, if one truly amounts to such, I went with range. But unlike the Rasengan, 
I had no intentions of throwing it. Tailed beasts don't throw their attacks, they either launched them as balls or consumed, and then fired them as a beam. I had no intention of swallowing my Rasengan, but firing it from my hand should be possible. So, I backtracked and learned to launch a normal Rasengan before getting back to the new technique. Starting off with the exterior of a Rasengan, I had poured Water Chakra into it. I envisioned it like a whirlpool with all the energy seeping in and then funneling into one point at the center. After forcing in what had to be a full 1% of my chakra, I was left with a super dense Rasengan the size of a baseball. A light blue ball of mass destruction if the new crater in the middle of the forest was any indication. I would remember that scene forever. Standing half a kilometer above the ground, arm tense as the technique was pointed downward. The slight recoil as it was launched and the sound of impact. As it hit the forest floor a fraction of a second later, the roar as the condensed water was allowed free into every direction. Trees and shrubs are like swept away me dropping down to stand in the middle of the muddy crater that might someday be a large pond. The realization that the new Jutsu would be a force to be reckoned with. Something that could reshape the land around it. The following months had been spent finitioning it. Although it would likely be the start or finishing move of a fight, the time spent building it up was too much. That was improved along with creating estimates of how much chakra had to go in to get desired outcomes. I made a point not to cause too much damage, but sacrifices had to be made. I'm sure the wildlife would appreciate the new bodies of water. Sitting in front of me is a small scroll, one with the new storage seal that I had designed and relied on Jiraiya to make a reality. After using storage scrolls for so long and seeing how useful they were, I had gotten curious. With the use of Fuenjutsu people were able to essentially create pocket dimensions that could hold things ranging from simple to complex, depending on the design. With a scroll as the medium, the seal acted as a door to that space whenever chakra was applied. My question had been simple. Could there be more than one door to that subspace? I hadn't liked the fact that once created, a storage seal could not be easily altered. And if it was ever damaged, then the contents inside that scroll would be lost forever. That was something most people did not know about storage scrolls. The fact that you don't actually put things into the scroll, but instead you anchor a portion of space onto the scroll, and then create an entrance and exit to it. The medium, mostly scrolls, determines how big the space will be, and what exactly it can hold. The seal plays a part in that too, but the medium is more critical. An example would be how people are used to hold the tail beasts rather than a scroll. Not only does it not make sense to put one there where it would have little use, but the paper simply couldn't do the job for something of that size and complexity. And Jinchuriki also exemplify how the medium doesn't hold the contents itself. Cutting open my stomach wouldn't reveal Kurama, because he isn't in me in that sense, but rather a subspace. Going back to the anchor part, a damaged seal no longer works for that function. The space collapses and placing another seal onto the same medium only creates a new space. The original is lost. But if there were two doors to that space, one could be destroyed without effectively losing the contents. Crisis averted. The fact that such a scroll could also be used to send messages between two people had been my selling point to get Jiraiya to help me. I was nowhere near good enough with Fuenjutsu to attempt something like that on my own and hope to succeed. Thankfully he had been happy to provide aid, and after three and a half months, we had a working model. Two scrolls that shared the same sub-dimension. As long as only one was activated at a time, things could be sealed and then unsealed from either end. That was what I was currently waiting on. Jiraiya had my scrolls counterpart, and would be sending me a signal after his preparations had been made. We would be unlocking the seal today, and rather than do it here, he had enlisted the toads to help, and thus the procedure would take place at Mount Mayaboku. He had told me of his plans this morning, and I had told him to go ahead and just give me a warning before having me reverse summoned. We would be spending quite some time there meaning I had to go procure groceries to last me the duration of my stay. Eating bugs was not something I ever wanted to experience. Movement coming from the scroll grabbed my attention. Part of the seal had activated for a few seconds, and then went inert again. Meaning that someone had activated the twin scroll. Prodding it with a finger and giving it some chakra, a small piece of paper was expelled. In 30, Ash J looks like he was ready. Picking up the scroll and raising to my feet, I wondered what it would feel like being reverse summoned. Perhaps something like the substitution jutsu, as long as you prepared yourself, the transition wasn't all that unpoth scenery suddenly changed. The sky was no longer just white clouds on a blue background. Instead there seemed to be slight aspects of pink and yellow added on. It was simply so vibrant. The vegetation shifted to mainly tall blades of grass and mushrooms. Those were also full of exotic colors that would have screamed toxic back home. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if someone described this scene as part of their drug-induced hallucination. I always imagined being high would look like this. Minus all the toad paraphernalia. In front of me was a waterfall, made from toad oil rather than water, leading to a fountain in the form of a toad with oil coming out of its mouth. To my sides were numerous statues which I knew to be once living creatures who fell victim to natural energy. Hopefully Jiraiya didn't meet the same end while trying to perfect his sage mode. And on the ground in an indented circle, lied what Jiraiya came here to prepare and another reminder that facing seal masters on their own turf was usually very foolish. 
I could make out several things from the seal matrix, a barrier around the boundary of the circle, various parts to drain chakra from whatever was inside the vicinity, paralysis aspects, and more. It likely took forever to link so many functions into one coherent seal, which I approve of. It meant he definitely wasn't playing around with the seal this time. While I had been appraising the area the two toads there had been doing the same to me. You're right Jiraiya boy. He looks so much like Minato-chan. Like a clone of him, Minato's looks and, until recently, Kishina's temperament, said Jiraiya with a chuckle. Turning to me he introduced the two toads on his shoulders, Naruto. On my right is Fukusaku-sama, and on my left is Shima-sama. They are elders here at Mount Mayaboku and are above even Gamabunta, the chief toad. Elders this is Naruto, Minato's son and my current pupil. Welcome Naruto. We are pleased to finally meet our latest summoner, said Shima. She was relatively small for a toad summon, both of them were actually. But I had no urge to put more thought into the size disparity I had noticed among the toads. Gamakichi was small as a young toad, Gamabunta huge as an adult toad, the elders small as old toads, and the toad sage big as the eldest toad. Doesn't make sense to me at all. That aside, Shima was a pale shade of green with purple hair compared to Fukusaku, and his darker shade and grey hair. Each one was wearing a cloak around their frames. Yes, Naruto boy, it's good to finally see you. Jiraiya speaks highly of you, added Fukusaku. Pleasure to meet you too as well, I responded. I appreciate you helping us with the unlocking procedure, even if their aid likely wouldn't be needed. Think nothing of it, we'll only be helping Jiraiya maintain sage mode. If something goes wrong, then perhaps we may take a more active role in things, Shima stated. Jiraiya's trump card. Huh? I turn to my sensei. You sure that will be enough? Of course. Senjutsu is one of the strongest forces in this world. Should be enough to handle this. He replied immediately. And if it's not, the seal should help to contain you. Sounds good. So, how do we begin? First, we need the key. Through a method that I had forgotten about, Jiraiya went into a gagging fit and regurgitated a new toad. An orange and black one with what looked like a folded accordion connecting the top and bottom half of his body. Wiping his mouth with his sleeve, he addressed the toad. Jeratora, if you would. Fine. But no, this this, he's not ready for such a task. I am only consenting because you won't stop bothering me. With that he rose to his full augmented height, and unraveled a scroll. On it was inked a long and complex array of kanji, with a simple square box around the center. Honestly, how much time did Minato have to create all of this? First a seal that was almost custom designed for Naruto to get stronger over time as well as this key. Jude was either really talented or he had these measures prepared just in case. Although I feel like the key was added as a concept way later in the series. But I digress. And Jiraiya was beginning to explain what he had in mind. You will be positioned in the center of that seal Naruto, and Jeratora will bring the scroll to you. Your only task is to place your hand on that square and accept the key. Jeratora will quickly leave the seal and then I will activate the barrier while we wait. If at any point in time we feel something is wrong, I'll also activate the other parts to suppress the Nine Tails power. Got it. Yeah, let's do this. I responded while already in motion, taking off the layers on my upper body and getting into the middle of the seal. I beckoned over the storage toad with a hand gesture. After letting him get into position, I channeled chakra to my fingers and placed a hand onto the square. This event had not been something I paid particular attention to while watching the Anion, so what happened next was new to me. The kanji on the paper pulsed and then moved in towards my hand, and then down my arm and body to my navel. It left an odd sensation down the path it traveled, almost like a chill. While I watched this happen, I could sense Jeratora leave the seal, and then a hazy wall go up around me. Sitting down on the ground, my conscious went inwards to my mindscape. It hadn't changed much. The forest clearing and cave were all still there. The white sky had not changed, except for the addition of a ball of light. Functioned as a sun during the day and then a moon at night. This moment has finally arrived, came Kurama's deep voice. Yes, I turned to see him standing just outside the clearing. The moment of truth, indeed. With a thought, the manifestation of the key appeared on my arm again. And seemingly as if part of a chain reaction, the seal lit up beneath me in the form of interlocking plates in a spiral formation. Slowly, I picked up the front of my top, which had reappeared with me here to place a hand on the corresponding symbol on my stomach. Here we go I guess. I rotated my wrist, and a clinking sound began. Both seals were becoming undone in a spiral pattern, starting from the inside and spreading out, until there was only a black circle. On the ground, the now unlocked seal flashed before disappearing. I felt the change right away. I heard it too. The raw Kurama let out threatened to deafen me. As it was only clinging to the floor with chakra kept me from being blown away. I stood my ground as the giant fox approached me. Either the seal had held back a large degree of his aura or he was purposely channeling it onto me. Despite that, even as he lowered his head to put his snout at my level, I held his gaze without flinching. Something undecipherable flashed across his eyes. Two years ago, we made a deal. His voice rumbled. To work together in return for two things. I had my doubts, 
But I agreed to the bargain all the same. I remember the day he was talking about with perfect clarity. The day he called me back into the mindscape with his answer after our initial talk. We had indeed made a deal that day. One that I intend to uphold. But today you have proven that your words hold weight. That you can be trusted. So, I'll place my faith in you. Continue to walk along this path. And you will always have my active support. Of course. If you renege, you will face my wrath. But until then, making a fist with his massive hand, he reached out to me, we are partners. I couldn't help but feel some relief as I raised my fist to bump his partners. A ripple spread out from our hands. A wave of energy that transformed the mindscape around us. Everything started to look more realistic. The trees lost their copy-paste appearance. The sky became more natural with clouds and an actual sun. There was even the sound of birds and other wildlife. The clearing that had only been meant for me expanded to easily fit Kurama. What we had tried and failed to achieve over a period of months had just occurred in a few seconds. But that fine though, progress is progress. Kurama's appreciative hum told me he likely agreed. You know, I didn't imagine this to resolve itself so anticlimatically. I began. I thought you would want to test me or something. Seemed like something you would do. Hearing the hesitation, I wrenched my eyes from the new landscape to look at him. You actually plan to fight me? I asked with a laugh. Yes. That was my intention some time ago. Not anymore. What changed? Fighting would have had no benefit. Kurama huffed. You can't truly defeat me in here. And I likely wouldn't have been able to land a meaningful hit on you. True. I nodded my head. Guess I won't have a reason to use the new Rasengan just yet. Perhaps some other time. There was a brief lull in the conversation before he spoke again. Are you not going to deal with that? He asked to my surprise. You can feel it too. Yes. He affirmed, I am even better attuned to you than before. Something like that can't be hidden from me now. Fine, I'll see you later then. Following the connection that had made itself known earlier, I vanished from the mindscape and appeared somewhere else. The first thing I noticed was how bright it was. The second was the figure already waiting there. Naruto Kunshi whispered as she moved towards me, arms outstretched. She was around my height. With fair skin, violet eyes, and a slender build, she was the picture of a gentle lady. The long red hair was also a nice touch. If you didn't know who Kishina Yuzumaki was while she was alive, you wouldn't be blamed for assuming she was a normal housewife. Her white top under the green dress also helped to sell the image. Of course, you would be wrong. Hell hath no fury like Kishina when enraged. Jureya had provided me with the inside scoop. Basically, don't piss her off, especially while she's pregnant. You would think that would be common sense. Not to Jureya. She's not pregnant right now. But it doesn't make what I have to do soon any less scary. Not quite, was my response. Her eyes which had been teary with happiness and sadness alike, narrowed in confusion and slowly rising alarm. Kaiubi. Not that either, I began. I am Naruto and more. A mixture of my previous self and a transmigrated soul. Dear Kami. She gasped. Are you okay? Was your soul damaged? How did this happen? Each question was rattled off into one barely articulate bunch. Good to see that mothers will be mothers even after death. It's a long story. And even I don't know how it happened. Sitting down on the ground which looked just like the rest of this place, I patted the space near me. Still with a worried look, she sat right across from me. I went on a critical mission, and my opponent landed a fatal attack on me. Instead of dying, I woke up in the hospital with these new memories. I knew they weren't mine from the beginning. But just having them there, it changed my perspective on a lot of things. I didn't even tell any of the villagers this, consider yourself lucky. Kishina returned my smile with a shaky one. What were the changes? I shrugged. I stopped being so immature as what Jureya tells me. He says I used to act like a younger version of you. But now I'm more like my father. Calling him that feels so weird. Like me. What's that old bastard trying to say? Her face became almost as red as her hair. I wasn't immature. His words not mine. Believe it. I said channeling the old Naruto. That brought her out of her plans for vengeance. She stared at me with a funny look before bursting into a laugh. You definitely got that from me you know. I would say it all the time. No matter how hard I try not to. Trust me. I know. She stared into my eyes for a little while searching for who knows what. You're really not lying. My son has two souls inside him. She said wistfully. I stayed silent. It feels like just moments ago I had baby you in my arms. And now you're almost an adult. So much happened that I wasn't there for. Will never be there for. But you're still my little boy. My son. No matter what. Raising up to her knees, she wrapped her arms around me in the hug that had been interrupted earlier. No matter what. I a little uncomfortably. I put my arms around her too. It might sound callous of me, especially to a mother excited to see her son one last time. But I couldn't wait for this part of the conversation to be over. I didn't like playing at being Naruto. But I also didn't want to tell Kishina that her son was long gone. In the end, it meant hugging her back until she finally released me and sat down again. So, two souls aside. What was your childhood like? She inquired. To which I had to hold back a wince. Starting off with the hard questions. Well, 
I won't say I grew up under the best circumstances, seeing her expression and her opening mouth, I forged on, but there were highlights. I found people who I could rely on, and I'd like to think that's what matters in the end. It took some time, but I'm in a good place at the moment. I've left any regrets behind. I'm so sorry Naruto-kun. Clasping my hand in hers, Minato and I had known things wouldn't be the best, but we'd had no other choice but to seal the Kaiubi inside you. I didn't like seeing her in tears. Even more so because I wasn't the one truly affected by the villagers' scorn. Don't worry about it. You're not to be blamed for what happened to me. I said squeezing her hand. No need to apologize to me. While she was wiping her eyes with her free hand, I saw it flicker. It must have meant what I think it did because all of a sudden, she was back to hugging me. I honestly thought we would have more time. Guess not. Before you go, I said, to which she pulled back to look me in the eye, you likely helped in the creation of the Horatian, right? I did, with the more esoteric parts. Are you recreating it? She asked with astonishment. No, I laughed. Me, working on the Horatian right now, if only. But since you are somewhat familiar with it, would you know of any barriers that can prevent the use of space-time techniques like that? Or how to go about creating one? She quirked her head to the side and thought, well, I never created one specifically for that purpose. But out in the real world, I opened my eyes. That was quite the experience. And it was actually talking to Kishina that had been the most eventful. Although I had not expected to meet either of the parents due to not being at any risk inside the seal, I was grateful for the information that Kishina gave me. It wasn't a solid plan to restrict the Kamui, but it was a place to start. Add that to my to-do list after returning to the leaf. Slowly getting back to my feet, I looked to where Jiraiya was standing to see him already in his sage mode, with a bulbous nose, amphibian eyes, and facial markings. I could see why he didn't like using it. Shima and Fukasaki were attached to his shoulders, also looking ready to intervene if necessary. I'm in control. I told them, you can lower the barrier. Jiraiya spent a few seconds analyzing me, probably using the enhanced sensory aspect of sage mode to detect any traces of Kurama's chakra that could influence me. A moment later he made a hand seal, and the hazy wall collapsed. I walked over to put my shirt back on. You were only out for a couple minutes. We had assumed it would take longer, stated Jiraiya and that there would be a noticeable difference, added Fukasaku. But nothing happened. That's not quite true. I walked over to the edge of the oil pool after getting dressed. You just can't see the difference until I do this. With that, I pulled Chakra from Kurama for the first time since waking up in this world. I was able to watch the transformation occur on the surface of the pool. Like I suspected, instead of the initial Kayubi cloak, we had moved straight into the second form. I had been wearing a black, long sleeve top and matching pants. But one wouldn't know that now. My upper body was covered in a layer of black with yellow tomo around my neckline. The yellow coloration formed a line from my throat to my stomach, where it combined with the black to form concentric circles, a representation of the unlocked seal. My pants and sandals were yellow now with a black line going down the front of each leg. Perhaps the most conspicuous part of the new look, aside from the blazing chakra cloak overall, was the Hayori that had formed out of nowhere. I could see more tomo on its collar and knew that there were other designs on the back as well. Aside from a layer of chakra also covering my skin, my face had changed a little. My pupils had become slits, and the whisker marks had thickened. Well, what do you think? I asked my captivated audience. Jiraiya looked stupefied, and the two elders weren't far off. Even Jeratora the skeptic had an expression of shock. You still believe Sage Mode is the most powerful force you've come across, Jiraiya? I goaded him. That's impressive, yes. But to think assume it's stronger than Senjutsu. Absolutely not. Was his comeback after breaking out of the trance. There's only one way to find out, isn't there? I took a step forward watching his eyes narrow. You've been getting overconfident as of late, Naruto. Perhaps it's time I beat it out of you. He got into his ready stance. Bring it, brat. I moved. I could see his expression of shock as my fist broke through his hasty defense and struck his nose. Watching him rocket off into the weird mushroom forest, I glanced at my chakra-coated hand. There was so much potential in this form and outside of clones of me. A sage would be the best method of testing exactly what it could do. Good thing I had one handy. Feeling Jiraiya rapidly closing in on my location, I put that thought to the side and got ready to go all out. Shippuden timeline Niji Hayuga was feeling an emotion that he always went to great lengths to hide from those around him. Uncertainty. All throughout life, he was called a prodigy. The best that the Hayuga clan had produced among his generation. Even if he was only a mere branch member, success had been the precursor to that title. And after obtaining it, further success became an expectation. The clan, his superiors, his teammates, they all expected the best from him. Some were undoubtedly waiting for him to fail, but others were supportive and had only the best of intentions. Despite that, Niji couldn't and wouldn't allow any weakness to show on his exterior. It was something he grew up with, and even the lesson he had been taught by someone he would like to call a friend couldn't change that. It was his ninja way. 
but the fact remained that this mission was turning out to be more formidable than he had expected. First, it was the intense battle against the missing nin from the mist, Kizum Hoshigaki, called the tail-less beast due to his vast chakra pools which he had made great use of. Upon defeating him, Team Guy had discovered that it wasn't even the real rogue ninja. It was a copy. Likely one much inferior to the real threat. That experience had truly opened his unique eyes to the monsters that were S-rank shinobi. People with such strength that they were considered suicide for regular ninja. And there were two more of them that they were expected to fight. Two who had supposedly defeated and captured a cage from one of the five main nations. An unsettling prospect. The sight of the multiple-eyed creature on the other side of the rock barrier had further raised his discomfort. It was only the presence of his sensei, and then later the arrival of the copy ninja, that had calmed his nerves somewhat. He also took solace in his teammates Tsunade's apprentice, and even the representative from Suna. Every little bit would help in the fight to come. After learning of the mechanics behind the five seal barrier and pinpointing the location of the tags, Niji was in the process of equipping the wireless radios that guy had brought. They were rather useful for circumstances like this. A simple solution to an obstacle that would have barred any team that wasn't composed of five Byakugan users. Now if only Lee would stop causing that irksome noise. He needn't have bothered thinking about admonishing him. His still active Byakugan allowed him to catch the next sequence of events and react to them, even if it was too little too late. Guy Sensei. He shouted in alarm. The calls. The two quickly approaching chakra signatures, with one being so bright it was like looking at a miniature sun. And that was over a kilometer away, a few hundred meters out, and the moving star dimmed in presence along with a drop in speed but it still landed just outside the group, before his last syllable could get out. The second figure was not far behind. Being a Jonan of Belief, regardless of how recent that promotion had been, Niji could immediately recognize Jiraiya of the Sanin. The red pigment and the horizontal bar around and in his yellow eyes had not been part of the description, but the overall appearance could only fit one person. If that's Jiraiya, then that means he turned to the first figure again. The black and yellow armor was certainly new, as was the golden eyes, but the blonde hair and whisker marks gave it away. Naruto. He heard Haruno whisper. He did not blame her for questioning her senses. The sudden appearance and weight of their auras had momentarily robbed him of his higher thinking as well. Such presence. Just how strong are you now, Naruto? Was his thought that went unanswered. Niji would remember what happened next for years to come and credit it for why he threw himself into more rigorous training. Where are they? Naruto had asked with his eyes on the forbidden tag. Niji had thought it was addressed to him, but Jiraiya had responded faster with the coordinates of the four other tags. Five clones had popped into existence and taken off in the required directions, while Naruto had created a blue orb of chakra in one hand. At an unseen signal, the clone that had jumped onto the rock entrance tore off the tag and the barrier had fizzled out. Three things had then happened in consecutive order. Naruto had pointed his palm holding the Rasengan at the wall, and the Jutsu had launched itself into it. The clone, who had flipped off the rock face, and Jiraiya both ran into the cave despite the pieces of rock falling down. In one hit Jiraiya shattered the skull of a blonde ninja sitting on a body, while the clone had launched itself at the other bulky figure, and decimated it with large fists seemingly made of chakra. Both had exited seconds after running in with the Kazakiage on Jiraiya's large shoulder. They had barely passed by Naruto before he had unleashed a jutsu into the cave. The temperature had plummeted before the gust of freezing air even left his mouth turning the inside of the cave into frozen wasteland. And just like that the fight had been over. He had barely seen it with his eyes that could see through walls and descending boulders. So he doubted any of the others had any idea what had occurred just then. But from their faces, he had known they were likewise amazed. Naruto and Jiraiya had shared a look before the Sanin had called for a retreat. Everyone had followed leaving only Naruto standing there which had confused Niji before his eyes had presented him with the reason. Dashing away, he had paid witness to it all, his friend floating high in the air, the collection of black and white particles that formed a black ball between splayed hands, the technique being fired and the devastation it caused, leaving no trace of what had once been there, no cave and no bodies. As the dead cage was resurrected and his villagers came out in full to show their love for him in a heart-touching scene, Niji couldn't find it in himself to really enjoy the positive atmosphere. His mind kept replaying what had transpired. The ease at which 2S-class shinobi had been utterly defeated. Two powerful criminals snuffed in seconds. And one of them by a clone of someone who had been around his level just years ago. A clone. After that defeat during the Chunin exams, Niji had started to believe in Naruto's dream of being Hokage. Maybe not right away because although he had the strength of personality, his physical strength was lacking. But he had seen him easily acquiring that power in a decade or so. Maybe longer. Instead, he seemingly had it right now. In two and a half years, Naruto had eclipsed the entire Kanoha Eleven. Maybe the entire village. Was there any single person who could contend with someone who could remain out of reach and rain death upon them? Create craters the size of the one he had just seen. Perhaps the loyal Sanin. Was Naruto S-Class already? 
Based on the little he had seen, it was possible. That made him reflect upon himself. What could he do in order to improve? He had and was already doing everything that he could to get stronger. Was he missing something? Perhaps Guy Sensei would have suggestions. And asking Naruto wouldn't hurt either. And thus, having a plan of action, Niji put those thoughts out of his mind. He could worry about that back in Kanoha. Finally. Sooner I would consider my stay at Mount Mayaboka was time well spent. I had achieved my primary goal which was fully linking with Kurama as well as learning Sage Mode. I will admit that becoming a Sage was on my list of things to do. But I had been fully willing to push it off if I had to. Luckily for me, I had found the time for both. The abilities of the two modes had some similarities, but were distinct. They both enhanced the physical body. The Kurama Chakra Mode, or KCM, gave more linear speed. From point A to point B. It was faster than Sage Mode. In return, Sage Mode allowed for greater understanding of one's body and surroundings, leading to faster reaction times. Strength went to Sage Mode and stamina was hard to decipher, due to neither mode having a limit that I could test. ACM came from Kirama, while Sage Energy came from Nature. One would take a long time to deplete, while the other was infinite as long as I had a way to continuously absorb it. Which I did. Durability went to KCM Mode. Regarding extrasensory abilities, KCM provided much greater range and precision to yin release. Empathy, but only for negative emotions. Sage Mode improved my chakra sensing by a wide margin. It had greater range, was more precise, and was a passive ability unlike my chakra radar. As an extension of the greater understanding of one's body and environment, Sage Mode allowed for better situational sensing. Stealth maneuvers against a Sage were almost impossible due to these traits. Sage Mode was the better enhancement for techniques. It provided both a boost in power along with greater control. A Medic Min would benefit greatly from using Senjutsu. Assuming they had the large chakra pool and strong body to evoke Sage Mode, ACM only augmented power as it allowed for more chakra to be used. They had other traits unique to each state. Using Frog Carter, which I was surprised to learn was its actual name. A Sage could take the natural energy and surround themselves with it. From there it could be used as an extension of their body to increase the range or power of their strikes. That energy was completely invisible to all senses unless one was also a Sage. ACM allowed for the use of Chakra Limbs. They could essentially come from anywhere on the cloak which added another degree of unpredictability. They helped close the strength gap that existed between that form and Sage Mode. And finally, there was the Kurama Avatar. Although only the Yang half, it was still the full size of Kurama when he was let loose on the Leaf Village. Something that Jiraiya and later Gamabunta confirmed. That was one of the reasons I had been happy to unlock the seal, and then test my abilities far away from the elemental nations. Keeping something of that size private would have been impossible. And I was all for having secret moves in my back pocket. The training the two forms required had been different. They both added onto my baseline stats. But only one of them gave me perfect understanding of how to make use of that boost in abilities. So, unlike Sage Mode, I had to learn to maneuver with KCM. Learn how much effort to exert to get the desired outcome. After that came incorporating all aspects of combat while in the Shroud. Upon getting a good grasp of using the Chakra Cloak, I had moved on to learning to harness Senjutsu. Something that Jiraiya had been refining while I was busy. Either due to having me there with him or just having that span of interrupted time to train. But he made great progress with his sage mode. The day he was finally able to enter that state by himself with only the standard changes was one to remember. It was interesting to note the difference in the color of the pigment around his eyes compared to Kanan Naruto. His were red, a color already associated with him, while Naruto had had orange, a color that he was infamous for. Lead me to think that personal preferences played a role in the final outcome, until I obtained sage mode with orange pigment as well. So, either preference didn't matter, or I had vestiges of Naruto in me. It was disappointing either way. Casually inferring about the benefit of clones and sage training, had seen Jiraiya passing another benchmark. I was happy that both of us had gotten something out of the trip. In the end, I had managed to stack the two modes to get the best of both worlds. Furthermore, I had been able to control the KCM to the point where I hovered just under the threshold. That would bring forth the full shroud. It provided a fraction of the physical enhancements but was more discreet. I only gained the golden eyes from the full transformation. It had no specific name, but I could maintain it as long as I was conscious. I'd like to think it looked like a personal dojutsu. Our departure from Mount Mayaboku had been heartfelt. They were a nice bunch, and their hospitality had been great. I had also gotten the confirmation that Gamakichi and his friends had completed their training and were okay to be summoned. I likely wouldn't need them for battles much, but they were enjoyable to be around. With a month left before Tsune would expect us to return, we had gone to the capital, where Jiraiya introduced me to a craftsman specialized in metalwork, specifically armor. He had seen most of the designs that ninja villagers used, and was able to give sound advice on what would work. After some compromise, we had settled on something reminiscent of what they wore during the warring era and the ambu vests. Of course, the color scheme was as I had decided early on during the training trip. A matte black that did a great job of not reflecting 
reflecting any light with golden trim and highlights. It consisted of a plate that covered both of my shoulders, a portion of my upper back and chest, and came with a raised collar. Two other plates were then used to cover both sides of my torso. Connecting them all were a series of straps made from something that looked like thick ninja wire. One went from the top of the chest plate to the top of the back plate, holding them up over my shoulders. Another was used to hold those plates tight to my body and were connected at the side. The last set was straps that went into my pits and held the shoulder plate down. Due to the way they were positioned, only the ones at my side were visible. Not that any ordinary strike could sever them, they were very durable. In that manner, the three separate pieces combined to form one cuirass that didn't limit my range of motion, while protecting the essentials. Besides that, I had also gotten a set of vambruses and a new forehead protector. My old one hadn't been damaged. I had simply wanted a different one. It was a replica of Jiraiya's, except it had more prominent horns that pointed straight up, and rather than superscript one it was engraved with exclamation point PA rather appropriate act of symbolism that everyone should strive for, not just me. Drawn onto the equipment were a number of seals. They were numerous and had taken quite a bit of time, but being able to anchor seals onto something close at hand was one of the reasons for my purchase of armor. With Sage Mode and KCM in my back pocket, I had natural defense measures for higher level combat, where the odds of being injured were present. But the armor provided me with a convenient place to have seals rather than depend on scrolls which took extra time. So, that whole endeavor may have been a result of my vanity. But I appreciated the appearance and functionality of the getup nonetheless. A person had to know when self-reward was appropriate after all. It was the least I deserved after wrapping up a training trip. That had seen me rise from a mere pawn in someone's plan for world domination to a significant player in the game. Because regardless of how much I had known, being weak would have doomed me in the end. But circumstances had changed, and thus, fate would be rewritten. We had been making our way back to the Leaf Village when a messenger toad had reverse summoned itself to us. Urgent news had come from Suna, so in an attempt to hasten the process, Sunaid had sent the notice through her summons. From the home of a Slugs, it had taken only a few hours to get to Mount Mayaboku, and from there they simply sent a toad with the message. It was a rather crafty way of communicating between two summoners, when location was unknown. Our hasty journey had taken us on a path that bypassed Kanoha and lead directly to Suna, where we had picked up the trail left by Kakashi and the gang. One stop to rest and then another for Jiraiya to summon the clone left behind to gather nature energy, and then we had been in position to blitz in. Honestly, Sasori and Diadara were not the type of ninja that posed a legitimate threat to us. They were the kind that used their special techniques at range so being landlocked and in a cave with only one exit, might as well be sitting ducks. Gara had already died, but Lady Chiyo had revived him like I had hoped. That possibility had been what I had banked on when I decided to make no mention of sending a two-way scroll to Tsunade. Fortunately, it worked out. Anyways, after the events of yesterday, it had not been the right time for a proper reunion, so we had made plans to get breakfast before retiring to our rooms. Rooms comprising of an entire floor in the best hotel Suna had. They were a grateful bunch. All most of them were. Walking down the sand pathways, I was discreetly scanning the people up and about and those still in their homes. At first, I had set out this morning to get the lay of the land and to check out their old architecture. I had thought it was interesting how they designed their round buildings out of what looked like clay. They likely had earth users who could create more of them as needed. Similar to Kanoha and how Yamato could create wooden buildings. But buildings could only hold my attention for so long before the people took it. They seemed friendly enough, with the civilians offering smiles and morning greetings. While the few shinobi were more reserved yet still welcoming, empathy detected traces of wariness and tension hidden under calm exteriors. But that could be attributed to foreign ninjas walking around unmonitored. Nowhere near the results I was expecting from people who had conspired with another village to attack their ally. But they hadn't been given a choice in that, had they? The cage commanded and they obeyed like the fatalistic patriots they were trained to be. That probably helped in putting the experience behind them. It also hadn't been their home that was invaded. Taking note of the sun's position, I looped back towards the hotel. Across from it was the restaurant we had picked, and since Jiraiya's signature was in there, the others were probably there too. I pushed the cloth entrance aside and jump. Everyone was present. Naruto, over here, yelled my pink head classmate from where they had combined multiple tables to fit the whole group. The three actual adults were sitting on one corner talking which left the teens to converse amongst themselves. Sorry for the wait. Woke up early to go exploring and lost track of the time. I explained taking the open seat between Sakura and Niji. Didn't mean to keep you all waiting. It is no problem Naruto-san. We haven't been here long. Lee spoke up. Good. So, looking around the place for a server, should we get to ordering now? Give me a quick moment to look at the menu. Actually Naruto, we already ordered. Jiraiya informed me from the adult corner. I picked something that I'm reasonably certain you will like, steamed rice, miso soup, soybeans, and some water to wash it down. My treat. Sounds good. Thank you. I gave him a nod before turning back to the others. Unlike the adults, they had all changed over the last two and a half years. All had gotten taller and filled out into proper teenagers. 
The attire was similar enough to what I remembered from the second part of the series, all customized rather than the usual wear of Chunin and Jonin ninjas. The closest to that standard would be Lee, and that's only because he's wearing a flak jacket over his green tracksuit. Mentally, I changed the possibility of Lee being Guy's son from maybe to likely. That resemblance is uncanny. It's good to see you all again. We haven't had the chance to speak properly until now. So how is everyone doing? Been keeping busy I would assume. Although I didn't feel the same way about these people as Naruto did. I was still happy to be around familiar faces. There was a sense of nostalgia there. Busy is an understatement. You would not believe how hard Tsunade Sensei has been driving us. Sakura responded. Can't say it wasn't effective however. Aside from that. I can't really complain. The last few years were good to me. That's what I like to hear. It's not too surprising really. Tsune took a girl who knew almost nothing about the medical arts, and in three years turned her into, not exactly an expert, but something close to it. Makeup guy was alive because of Sakura after all. How about you three? Actually, do you still go by Team 9? Not anymore, we're all past that now. Tenten replied blithely before Mok saluting. Team Guy, at your service. Indeed, nodded Niji. Since every member of our team advanced past Jenin, our old team number was inserted back into the cycle. Tenten and Lee are Chunin, while I'm a Jonin. Jonin, congratulations Niji. I always thought you would be one of the first to make it. You and Shikamaru. He just gave me another solemn nod before I turned to the others. Not that making Chunin isn't an accomplishment you two, or three. Sakura. Yeah, I got promoted too. She confirmed. Okay, you, I did have my doubts about. But I'm happy to see you prove them unfounded. Good job. I nudged her arm and smiled to make sure she knew it was a joke. She rolled her eyes but smiled back. But really though... I missed a lot. It was for the best however. You honestly did. The pinkette replied with a smirk. I sense a comeback. Out of our class, you're the only genin left. Kiba isn't going to let you forget that. Chem PH, you make it sound as if I spent my time away doing nothing. I scoffed. Let him say something. I'll teach him better. Won't win by farting in his face this time either. I am most curious Naruto-san. Startedly, polite as always. Stressing over honorifics isn't my thing but I realize it's a custom here even among peers, so I don't let it get to me. At least he didn't call me Naruto-kun, or Chan. I became somewhat accustomed to it at Mount Mayaboku, but that's only because the elders are decades older than me, and mean well. You are stronger than before, very much so. What tactics did you use to fan the flames of your youth? Hum, funny you should ask that. I leaned back and panned an eye over the group to see everyone watching me. Guess my entrance really caused a stir among them. I followed in your footsteps and placed special emphasis on Tajutsu and my physical capabilities. Truly, he looked really excited to have found another Tajutsu enthusiast. Can't blame him as it's a good thing to be skilled in. A ninja's bread and water, and a better base body means my various amps become more potent. Yeah, lots of spars with Jiraiya and training with weights. Don't know how it compares with your training. But I think it worked well for me. Really well, I would say. But you also learned new jutsu, didn't you? Asked Niji. I had not been aware the Rasengan was a ranged technique. Assuming I am correct regarding the jutsu you used. Don't forget the jutsu he used to freeze the cave. He didn't have that before he left either. Sakura pointed out. You're right, both of you. I have a few techniques which complement my current fighting style. Not so much the second one. But the Rasengan will always be a favorite. Makes sense. It's a strong technique. What I want to know is where you went during your trip anywhere interesting. Despite Tenten's open-ended question, her eyes ran over my forehead protector and my arm guards, which keyed me in as to what she really wanted to know. A lot of places, but most recently the capital. I saw no reason not to answer that bit. Not many ways it could come back to bite me. Jureya has a contact there who helped me design and forge the various pieces I'm wearing now and the armor from yesterday. If you're ever there, ask for a smith named Hanashi and tell him I sent you. Might get a discount. We'll keep that in mind. Why infinite? She pressed. That was a good question. My horn forehead protector was based off Jureya's. But when it came to what I wanted engraved on it, I ran into a wall. Ideally, it should have been something that I identified with like how the old pervert chose oil, due to his summons having a connection with the substance. I like the Toad Clan, but I certainly wasn't as close to them as my sensei was, so that was a no-go. I already have the Yuzumaki patch on my right shoulder and putting the leaf symbol on it, would have made getting a unique protector pointless, so those options were struck off the list. I also considered putting a Rin Shiring in there purely for the image that horns and a third I would paint, but I ultimately decided that was a bad idea. If certain parties in the know saw that, it would raise questions and make them wary of me. No, it's best if they keep underestimating me. In the end, my mind returned to my goal. The purpose that I had set for myself from the very beginning. To rise to the top and thrive in this world. The more I know about it, the more obvious it became that reaching S rank was not enough. 
not even the upper tier of that class. To really thrive, I needed power. Power that probably hasn't been seen in this land for centuries. My mind had catalogued all the issues I had to deal with. The Akatsuki, Sasuke, Orochimaru, Black Setsu. Aside from them were potential threats. Midara Ichiha being resurrected and getting his original Rinnegan. Kagayal Tsutsuki, the lady hidden in the moon. And then whatever Kishimoto, or whoever it was, put into Boruto. Following after the war arc means that those antagonists would have to be incredibly powerful to have any meaning to the storyline. Either that or cheats. The problem is that I never took an interest in the sequel to this series, aside from the occasional YouTube fight. I would be going in blind. Meaning the only way to ensure victory was to be stronger. To have such overwhelming power that when the time comes, I'd curb stomp my enemies like Madara did to the Shinobi Alliance. But with no real knowledge of what the other horny aliens or ninjas could do, there was no way to know when I had reached their level. So surpassing them and leaving them helplessly outgunned, became the only path to success. Hence infinite. It symbolizes a promise I made to myself before I left the village. If I want to be able to face the threats that are after me, I need to strive for constant improvement, to keep getting stronger or risk being killed. These threats do you mean the Akatsuki by that? The same group that attacked the Kazakiage in his own village. Tenton asked tentatively. Hum, was it possible she didn't know? She is a Chunin meaning she could be more aware of what went on in the leaf. But she's also part of my generation. So perhaps that had something to do with it. Yes. The Akatsuki. A group of S-ranked criminals who have made it their goal to hunt down all Jinchuriki and take their tail beasts. Killing them in the process. I confirm for her. And then to test my hunch. And I am on their list of targets. I hold inside me the nine-tailed fox that attacked our village years ago. My attention went to Niji after I said that. His impassiveness wasn't just a good poker face. He actually wasn't surprised unlike Tenten and Lee, and to a lesser degree Sakura. Resignation and even pity but no surprise. Interesting. As long as they are around, I won't be able to exist peacefully. I broke the heavy silence. Either they will come for me like they did with Gara, or they'll catch me on a mission. Conflict between us is inevitable. So, I decided to prepare myself and take my future into my own hands. Your dedication is admirable Naruto-san. Lee spoke up after meaningful looks with the other Leaf Nin. But as your comrades we cannot in good faith allow you to bear such a burden alone. And I appreciate that Lee. Only time will tell just what kind of threats they'll throw at us. But perhaps it's best if we leave that subject to a different setting. I don't want to ruin the light atmosphere. Certainly, Naruto-san. Lee nodded. So, did you decide to pick up a weapon at all? If so, I wouldn't mind having a sparring partner. Thankfully Tenten was there for convenient subject changes. As much as it annoys me, getting some type of primary weapon is one of the few things that were neglected over the training trip. I sigh. I'm a wind user so any bladed weapon would have been downright deadly in my hands. But there's only so much we could pack into the short amount of time we had. That and the fact that extending myself to cover everything that interested me would have meant sacrificing proficiency in other areas. And Jiraiya doesn't really use swords, so he wouldn't have been a good teacher, really. I'm a weapons mistress myself. Perhaps I could help you out. Some one-on-one -on -one training. She offered. Perhaps. But just to clarify, would you be showing me how to properly wield them or how to throw them at my opponents? I couldn't help myself. To my side, Sakura snorted and quickly looked the other way. Tenton's teammates likewise found other things that grabbed their attention. I'm going to pretend you didn't say anything. She said with a glare. Hey, that's a genuine concern. I laughed, last time I saw you fight, you did exactly that. Against a wind user. I didn't know she was a wind user until it was too late. Besides, that was the past. I would definitely beat that I wear a kimono while fighting fangirl now. That got a little laugh out of me. Guess she wasn't fully over the fan to the back thing. The San siblings used to be vicious back in the day. Even the makeup guy. I'm sure you could. I lied, don't really know who would win at this point. And I had originally planned on just paying a sword user to spar with me. But I'll see if I can fit you into my busy schedule Tenton. You make us sound like it would be you doing me the favor. Like you wouldn't benefit from having another moving target. Sensing something? I raised a hand to her. I think the food is coming. Indeed, a couple servers were wheeling over a cart laden with steaming plates. The smell emanating from them made me even hungrier. Nothing beats having hot food prepared for you. Almost nothing. Our stay in Suna had finally come to an end. And because I had friends in high places, the Kazakiage and his associates had come to see us off. The rock steps and setting sun created a nice backdrop to touching moment. I suppose this is goodbye Naruto. More like until next time. I have a feeling we will see each other soon. Stay safe, Gara. And you as well. He responded, taking my outstretched hand. Make sure to stay in contact. You have no excuse now. Lowering my voice some, and deal with that too. I will. 
He replied, head dipping just a slight bit to signal he had received the message. I nodded and stepped back, ending the handshake. Well, I'll take my leave now. It's about time Naruto Yuzumaki returned to the leaf. Tamari, Kankuro, until next time. Bye Naruto. Farewell. With one last round of goodbyes, we began our trek back home. He should be fine now. Since Shukaku was removed, the Akatsuki had no reason to come back to Suna. None that I knew of at least. And with a pair of jewel end scrolls linked to me and soon Tsunade, Gara should be able to communicate with us faster in case something does happen. Only time would tell. Good work teams Guy and Kakashi. I expect written mission reports by noon tomorrow, but for now, you're dismissed. Tsunade commanded the members of the Gara rescue mission. Falling out of attention, they trickled out of the room. Sending one last look over her shoulder, Sakura closed the door behind her, leaving inside the exact group of people who had been present when I left for the training trip. Moving to stand directly in front of her desk, I compared that day to the present. Not much had changed. Shizun was still wearing her black outfit and standing behind Tsunade. The Hokage looked the same on the exterior. Jureya had found the same wall to lean against with arms crossed. The room looked just as underwhelming as last time. I swear, if I ever got swindled into taking that position, I'll rearrange some things. With the squad of clones I would have helping me, we'd need more space and more seats. The wallpaper would likewise have to go, hours staring at such dullness would get to even the most work-oriented person. Maybe a personal computer, or for if they can advance technology that fast. Yeah, that could work I can see the training had great results. Started Tsunade bringing an end to my thoughts of ergonomics and office decor. Of course. What were you expecting? The same kid with a bigger Rasengan. I joked. No, I had complete faith in you. She smiled. I'm happy to see it was worth it. It wasn't all me. Although he may be lazy at times, Jureya has a lot to offer. He really did. I can't make excuses for his canon counterpart. But this one just needed a slight push. And an attentive student to really shine. I can see how he helped produce some of this world's strongest shinobi. That he does, she cast a glance to where he stood getting a thumbs up in reply. Turning back to me, she pulled two things from her drawer and placed them onto her desk. Jureya sent me word of your progress in the missions you did. Here, this is well deserved. Catching the ceiling scroll and releasing its contents. I held a green flak jacket draped over my arm, and a smaller scroll in my hand. Naruto Yuzumaki, you are hereby given the rank of special jonin and the responsibilities that come with it. Do the village proud. Tsune declared officially, that scroll has the basics of your new position. I don't think I have to tell you to read it soon, do I? No, you don't. I put the items back into the storage scroll. The jacket would likely remain there as I had no desire to wear it. The manual would be read later. I didn't ask for it. But since you offered, I'll accept this promotion. She snorted, letting go of the hokage air. Was there any possibility of you turning it down? She asked. Not really. I wouldn't want to be the only genin from my graduating class. Sakura's taunt got to me. And genin were heavily restricted in the departments they could access in the village. This would unlock some doors for me. I'm sure it would have been amusing watching you take the tune-in exams again. She said with a laugh, I could have won big betting on you. I doubt anyone would look at me and then bet against me. I countered. You do have the look of a strong ninja. She agreed and then talked over my response, a bit pretentious but strong nonetheless. Jealousy is not a good look on you, Tsunade. Wiping a hand across my new forehead protector. What's in the other thing? Oh, this is your key to your new apartment. I signed the papers in your name and used the rest of the money to furnish the space. The address is written down. Thank you. I reached out for the parcel. What about food? A Genin team was assigned a D-rank mission to stock your fridge and shelves. I believe it was Konohamaru's team actually. Perfect. And actually, I have something for you as well. Sending a pulse of chakra into a seal on my left gauntlet, I handed over what came out. A scroll, weight one for storage, and blood and chakra identifying elements. Tsunade commented while analyzing it. It's better than a common storage scroll, but why exactly do I need this? Prime it and then I'll tell you. Go on, it's not dangerous. Chem PH. Doing just that with a drop of blood and a chakra infusion, the ink flashed red, and then went back to black. It's done. Good. Now, that seal is something Jureya helped me create, I explained. As my spiel came to an end, both Tsunade and Shizun who had crept forward for a better view, were looking at it with calculating eyes. My lady, think of the possibilities. We could dash. I know Shizun. So simple in concept yet this could be extremely beneficial to our ninja. She sent a glare at Jureya. Why didn't you tell me of this earlier? It's not his fault. I butted in. He helped me yes, but it wasn't his creation. As such, it was entirely up to me regarding who got to know about. And I decided to keep it close to my chest until I found a way to secure the mechanics behind the seal. No one would be benefiting from my creation for free. Taking in Jureya's nervous smile and my unapologetic expression, she huffed before turning back to the scroll. This is connected to the one the Kazakij holds. At my confirmation she continued, could you make some connected to me on one end, 
but open on the other. I can. I have a system in mind that could work. If you are indeed thinking what I am thinking, give me a day or so and I can make you multiple sets. Fine. I have other questions. But I suppose you would want to settle in first. Stop by the hospital tomorrow around midday and then return here. Got it. See you tomorrow. Bye Shizun. Later, Jiraiya. While heading to the door, I pulled out the parcel with the key and address. Now, where exactly is this place? My first reaction upon walking into my apartment was a positive one. Located in a nicer district with a greater shinobi presence, it was a real upgrade from my old one. The front entrance opened up to the main room, with an alcove to the left side, where the kitchen was located. A short hallway at the back led to two doors, one was the bathroom and the other the single bedroom. As Tsunade had promised each area had the appropriate furniture, and the kitchen was well stocked. It still lacked the personal touch to show someone was currently living in it but it would make quite the bachelor pad. Just needed some decorations. And one more thing. Going about unsealing various scrolls from my own guards and then unsealing my belongings from those. I placed everything onto the bed. It wasn't a small quantity. Clothes, souvenirs, cooking supplies, and other miscellaneous items. I kept almost everything I owned in seals, which is why I had gone to such lengths to protect them. It just so happened that the method I used had other applications as well. Setting aside my sealing equipment, two shadow clones came into existence and grabbed them. They had the task of adding protections to the apartment. Nothing outrageous like the five seal barrier but convenient all the same. Proximity seals around the door and windows to detect people who would try to enter the apartment. Privacy seals that aren't public knowledge. These were used in the Hokage's office and other important buildings. They prevented members of the Hyuga clan from gazing through walls at their leisure. Needless to say, they were a well-guarded seal, and only Jiraiya being my sensei had given me access to them. Other privacy-oriented seals would be added, but they were of lesser effect. Moving around the room and organizing my belongings. I thought of my plans for the immediate future. The Hokage expected more dual-ended storage seals tomorrow, which was easy to manage with the aid of clones. As long as she provided the scrolls for them, they weren't overly expensive, but I would need a large number as each set required two of them. My funds were rather low after my recent expenditures. She also wanted me to get a medical examination before going back onto active duty. All that was my reasoning for the hospital visit. It was likely though, my information from years ago needed to be updated for the registrar. Going to see some old faces was on my list of obligations as well, but reunions would be postponed for a while if I couldn't get them done soon. Because in a few days I would have to leave the village for a special rendezvous with some snakes. When I had silenced Sasori before he could expose his secret, it hadn't been because I forgot about his little spy. Rather, it had been because I already knew that I didn't give him a chance to talk about it. The meeting being exactly 10 days after his defeat had made it easier to remember the when. And approaching the where like a multiple choice exam on a map of the elemental nations had gotten me the Tenchi Bridge. It was the one of two that sounded familiar, and the other one was where Kakashi's life had gotten derailed. So, with the necessary information, there had been no need to allow others to hear about a spy with connections to Orochimaru. Because after seeing how it went down in canon, I had an idea of what following that route would have led to. At my current level, it wouldn't have been too far-fetched for Tsune to ask me to capture the spy and bring them back. Even if it did turn out to be Kabuto. In fact, depending on the composition of the team, she might have expected for Orochimaru to finally be caught as well. The infamous trader imprisoned and made to pay for his misdeeds at last. The leaf would rejoice and everyone would feel safer. Unfortunately, that's not what I wanted. I wanted them dead. I wanted them out of the picture with no chance of returning. There was a reason why I considered Madara and then Kagaya as potential threats. If I could prevent the resurrection of the ultimate Achiha, then the war arc was almost guaranteed to not happen. At the least it would be shorter. Kigaya may have been released and used as the big bad guy, but Madara had done most of the leg work. In fact, I have doubts about Naruto and Sasuke being capable of victory, because unlike with Dotsutsuki, they would have had to kill Madara to win. Therefore, Madara should not be allowed back. Short of using the Rinnegan, there was one other way people could be brought from the dead in this world. Summoning. Impure World Reincarnation. A Kenjutsu that the rogue Sanin had stolen and one which Kabuto would use to great effect in helping Abito fight his war. It's not impossible that others knew how to use it. With Black Setsu having spied on and manipulated many important figures over the years and Abito having the ability to warp into protected locations. But Setsu wasn't capable of Jutsu on his own, and Abito could never be as great with that technique as Kabuto would be. Furthermore, those two were hard to pin down until later on. The snakes on the other hand, they would essentially be coming to me. Propriety would dictate I go forth to receive them. It was not written in stone that capturing them would end with them escaping again. Rather, the possibility of them being executed for good was there. But the consequences of either one escaping could be disastrous. As such, I would deal with them myself. Besides, it was about time I met the latest reincarnation of Indra. 
Hinata pulled with deft movements cultivated from experience. She carefully unfolded the paper to reveal the dried pink tulip within. Bit by bit, Hinata gently peeled the plant from the paper and flipped it onto its face. She reached to the side for the special adhesive and applied a few drops to the main part of the flower and the thickest area on the stem. She made sure her fingers were clean before lifting the plant and laying it onto a white canvas and softly pressing it down. Eyes roving and not finding any mistakes, the Hayuga sat back with a smile of satisfaction. It would take a short while to dry out fully. But after that the process would be complete. Another pressed flower to add to her collection, pink tulip for caring and good wishes. Would fit right in with the others patiently waiting to be gifted to their intended recipient. Someday, Hinata had taken up flower pressing at a young age. Even before the academy provided a lesson regarding the art to all its young Kinochi in training, the Hayuga clan had seen fit to introduce it. Being traditional and elegant, not to mention feminine, the heiress simply had to learn it. Learn it, enjoy it, and be good at it. An appearance had to be kept after all. That's not to say she didn't actually like it. The art became an honest pastime of hers, and finding new flowers to immortalize on canvas became something to look forward to. It also helped that she had a teammate whose signature partners could point her towards interesting plants, and a classmate who knew flowers and could share their meanings with her. A soft knock on the door drew her attention. Hanata Sama. She recognized that voice. Niji San. She stood and made her way to the entrance, sliding the door aside to see her cousin. Welcome back. Ah, would you like to come in? I would like that. He accepted her offer with one of those soft smiles she still hadn't gotten accustomed to and stepped into the room. I see you made another. Yes, I had some time for myself. How was the mission? Did it go well? She questioned him as they both sat down. She hadn't seen her cousin for almost two weeks because of a mission his team accepted. It had sounded rather simple for a team of their talent, so she'd expected him back much sooner than today. Needless to say, she had worried as the days went by with no sign of his return. It went well Hanata-sama. Niji responded. She wished he would stop addressing her so formally, but she understood he did it as a way to atone for his treatment of her in the past. Something she has already forgiven him for. We were returning when Hokage-sama sent word for Team Guy to provide assistance to another. Team Kakashi had been assigned to help rescue the Kazakij after his abduction, and seeing as how we were nearby, our team served as support. Abducted, she voiced. He was young, but no one could deny the power Gara wielded. His chakra reserves and creativity made his sand dangerous to most shinobi, especially in the desert where Suna was located. She was not quite certain just what measures would be required to abduct one like him. Was he recovered? In a fashion, yes. But with further assistance aside from my team, that's also the reason for this visit in fact. Another smile passed over his lips. It seemed Hokage-sama had informed Aruto san his friend was in danger as he and Jiraiya-sama arrived in time to defeat the Akatsuki members. To her mind, Niji may as well have stopped talking halfway through his last sentence. Naruto-kun, excited as she was, she almost didn't note the stuttered speech she had been working so hard to eliminate. Naruto-kun was there. He was. Niji indulged her and went on to relay his last mission and the conversations with her blonde interest. Hinata's mind was abuzz by the end of it. It sounded like his time away had been used to great effect, and she couldn't be happier for him. For so long Naruto-kun had had his sights fixed to the Hokage position, and now he had the means to support his case. He was much closer to his dream than before he left which was a good thing. So she was definitely happy, but also to a lesser extent worried. Being powerful attracted attention both good and bad, and it seemed Naruto-kun already had powerful enemies after him. She agreed with Lee Sen in this case. The blonde should not have to carry that burden alone. She wouldn't allow that after he'd already endured so much by himself. Determination bubbled within her as it became obvious what she had to do. No one could say Hinata had been lax in her training over the last two and a half years. Yet it was apparent she had to take it further. Reach new heights if she wished to stand beside the one who inspired her so. She may have shied away in the past, and even now lacked the self-confidence to admit her feelings to him. But she could do this at least. And perhaps that newfound strength would lend itself to more personal matters. Kanoha back in college. I had only a vague idea of what my life would look like at age 25. My student loans would have been paid off. I would have a job that I somewhat enjoyed. And perhaps there would be a steady girlfriend in the picture. Nothing too extravagant, but more than enough to be satisfying. Yeah, I also had dreams of coming up with a big idea and striking it rich. But I knew just how unlikely that was. A source of motivation where all those hallucinations would amount to. Of course, my current reality is even more fantastic than those dreams. Supernatural ninjas. Actual plots for world domination. Being in the very center of it all in a new body. Honestly, it was a lot to chew at times. More so because it was all from an anime I was very familiar with. Makes me question the logistics of it all. Was Kishimoto the creator of this universe? Or was he just viewing the events from Earth? But if he is the god of this unfinished story, as of what I remember of my old life, was he out there adding in details that were twisting the timeline? 
Would I someday run into something specifically designed to wipe out Naruto in an attempt of character development for Boruto? There was no way to be certain, and thus the best response to those queries was to push them aside and focus on the present. Needless worrying would only stress me out. Leave me with hair like Jiraiya's. Not a good look on me, it's a good thing that this world had some positives to focus on instead. Friends and acquaintances. Good food, indoor plumbing, even the amazing view of Kanoha right before the sunset is seen from the Hokage Monument. The bustling of people living their everyday lives. Some filled with joy while others stewed in malcontent, but each had their own aspirations for the future. Too bad none knew of a storm brewing on the horizon. Oh, there were plenty of experienced veterans familiar with the darkness of the ninja life, but none knew just what was waiting around the corner. And if I got my way, they would never learn of it. I would do my best to ensure that. Not for the leaf per se, even now there are some with lingering animosity towards me. But for the different people I actually cared for, and because of how bad the final end game was. Either stuck in the infinite Tsukuyomi or sucked dry of Chakra by Kagaya. Both outcomes were undesirable and not something I would allow to happen. My death being a requirement in the two plans simply guaranteed my protest. Anyways, looks like she had finally arrived. Hey, Naruto. Greeted my expected guest. Sakura, you're just in time. I waved her over. You've probably grown used to it. But this sight brings back memories for me. No worries there. I'll never get tired of seeing the sunset from up here. I think you picked a great spot to talk. She commented to which I agreed. It provided a scenic setting along with privacy. One I enjoyed and the other I appreciated when it was available. Privacy could be hard to come by in a hidden village. Sitting down next to me on Minato's head, we spent a few moments in silence before she broke it. So, Shizun told me about your promotion. JHM. Oh, I received it the day we got back. It wasn't a total surprise to me though. I replied, I'll bet. You and Lord Jiraiya took out those Akatsuki Shinobi so easily. You must be at least special Jonan by that alone. There's that, but I also figured all the missions I'd done over the past year helped my case. I shrugged. What kind of missions? She inquired. I started with a bandit elimination. Which ones to mention? Afterwards I did some find and retrieve for different clients, intel gathering, escorts, and even bounty hunting. It was an eventful year. Well no wonder you got promoted. You probably have more experience than a lot of our friends. I can't even imagine what doing missions with you would entail now. More S rank nin. She shook her head. I can see why Lady Tsune didn't reactivate Team 7. Actually, that's because I requested it. Let me explain, I interjected before she could get upset. I want to be able to pursue the Akatsuki, and Tsunade already had the idea of creating squads to hunt them down. So, I figured that with our new communication scrolls, whenever a squad found their trace, I would just head out to meet up with them. Having to bring others along would slow me down. Are you really that fast that Lady Tsunade would allow you to move alone? I am. Besides time and space techniques, I can probably travel long distances faster than anyone live. With the Aero Step, I could use my Chakra Cloak to its fullest without worrying about being seen by people on the ground. Incredible. You really benefited from that trip. I guess I would have been dead weight if we teamed up again. Huh? Her good cheer from earlier less visible. No one could realistically be expected to keep up, Sakura. It's not a slight against you. And besides, after two months I'll be able to take any type of mission, meaning we could team up even if it wouldn't be an official Team 7 thing. Why two months? She asked no longer as downcast. With the attack on Gara, we believe that the Akatsuki is mobilizing right now. I go back to active duty next week, and for the following two months, I'm on standby in case we get intel of their movements, meaning no missions that go outside our walls. Oh, okay. That seems logical. I'm glad it did because I had argued my case with that reasoning, so I would have time to focus on important stuff rather than on filler missions. As it was, I had barely managed to extend my inactivity period, in order to fit in sneaking off to Tenchi Bridge tonight. Enough about that. Have you started on what we talked about? I asked with a side glance. Huh? Oh, about the training. Sakura asked to which I nodded. No, I have no idea where to start, and I haven't seen Kakashi in the three days since we got back. Her shoulders sagged. No idea where to start you say? Well, I've been working on something that should help you. It definitely did so for me. As I said that, a burst of chakra unsealed something from my gauntlet. Despite my hesitations about revealing more about my abilities than I wanted to, there were ways that I could strengthen my allies, without giving my enemies too much leverage. This tool was one such method. How many storage seals do you have on those things Naruto? And what are these for? She asked picking up a belt from the stack I had deposited on the ground. I don't really need a belt, never mind this many. You remember the training tool I mentioned to Lee? You made more. She asked looking at them with a more appreciative eye. Yes ma'am, I made some for you. Our old classmates, team guy, and even Konohamaru's team. I want you to distribute them. I explained. Really? Thanks, Naruto. These must have taken you a long time to make with how complicated they look. She gushed. I think you forgot what my signature jutsu was Sakura. I laughed. With a few clones, it hadn't taken over 20 minutes. Right. 
Those shadow clones are really useful, but still, thank you. You're welcome. And I have some words of guidance if you want to hear it. I offered, looking her straight in the eye. Um, sure, taken aback by the sudden intensity, she took a while to respond. I never thought that you of all people would be offering sound advice, but please, anything would help. Okay. I took a moment to gather my thoughts. I think that a great ninja is one that is strong in body and mind. They should be fast, quiet, and efficient. I realize that not all situations allow for these characteristics, but when you make good use of them, conflicts can be ended quicker and more decisively. It's also easier to develop those traits than obtaining powerful jutsus to rely on. You following so far? Yeah. She nodded. Where did she pull that notepad from? A, hey, not important. Now what does this look like for you? You're probably wondering. Well, this is what I think. For the most part, you don't need to worry about the mental aspect. I haven't seen you in action so I can't judge your Kinochi mentality. But I do remember how smart you are. That ability to think will take you far. So, that leaves the physical side of things. You're really good with enhancing your strength with chakra. You will likely get even better with time. But what you can start doing now is raising your baseline strength. That tag should help with that speed as well. Wear it only when doing physical training. And I guarantee results. Especially if you can facilitate muscle repair and strengthening using your medical know-how. That kind of training and my rapid regeneration is one reason for my current strength. The sound of pen on paper could be heard over the general din of the still lively village. Is this how teachers feel when students actually pay attention to them? It's not a bad feeling. There is likely a limit to how far you can push your body in that fashion. But you won't know until you try it. You always need a disclaimer. Through that method, you would be faster, stronger, and better able to react to perceived stimuli. Even if you don't become a frontline fighter, those would benefit you as a medic while avoiding danger. Taking a breath, I forged on. With your good control and intellect, I think you could get even more out of Tsunade's super strength technique. Instead of focusing on attacks only, use it towards movement. By channeling precise bursts of chakra and calculating time and angles, I think you could have your own variant of the body flicker. You probably know better than me if that's physically possible. It might be, she said hesitantly, there would be so many variables to account for, like reinforcing the muscles in the legs and spine, and then keeping the body oriented while in motion. Making sure the chakra expelled is focused towards propulsion of the user would be another thing. A clearing of my throat brought her back to reality. It's good to know it isn't a mere pipe dream. Having high speed along with your high damage potential makes for the best combination. The final thing that I remember from your sensei's style is that she lacks ranged attacks or simply doesn't use any. I assume it's the same for you and was thinking ninjutsu could help you there. What's your elemental affinity? Earth. Before you ask, I haven't had the most time to train it with all the training and hospital work I've been doing. She preempted me. That was the expected answer, but not too pleasing. I knew few earth techniques, and they all came from Jiraiya's repertoire. Not the kind that someone with small reserves and an untrained affinity could reasonably use. Even with great chakra control. Okay? That can be a long-term goal then. I settled. Perhaps later on. My other suggestions are Jinjutsu and using your ninja tools. Those can supplement your other abilities regarding your lack of range. Overall? I think you should work on your physical training and figuring out that body flicker technique. I hope that provides some clarity. Yeah, it does, making a few last minute marks before closing the notepad and stowing it away. Thank you Naruto. I had thought you were being patronizing when you said to expand my skill set, But you just gave me excellent starting points. And the training belt. That will really help, she said with a radiant smile. No problem Sakura. I may not be able to actually train you at the moment but I can definitely provide guidance. You are also much easier to help than the others. Yeah, I suppose training a clan shinobi must be challenging. Sakura agreed. The majority of the Kanoha 11 were clan kids. Heck, even I came from one although it could be considered endangered. Anyways, from a young age they had been introduced to the shinobi arts that their clan used, and had developed their style around their unique techniques. Some clans hardly restricted their members, the Senju, Ichiha, Yuzumaki, Saratobi, and many more. Everything was open to them. Once upon a time, it would have been very possible to run into one of those members who were proficient in every art. The worst type of ninja to face. On the other hand, were those clans with jutsus or abilities that had been honed over generations and taught to each member. That resulted in capable fighters, yes. But they were also stuck into a predetermined mold. Specific to jutsu styles, ninjutsu team formations, etc. For one of them, rising in strength was a matter of becoming better with their clan techniques, and adding minor alterations here and there. And that is what made helping them so hard. But, because every ninja was expected to stay fit, the weight belt could be easily incorporated into their training program. Things that involved taking up chakra that would normally be used in clan techniques required more forethought and likely a more convincing argument. Sakura though, she had no clan, and even as a medic, she was more attuned to Tsunade's brand. Meaning she had offensive capabilities, and I knew enough about how they worked to offer advice. That's right. 
Standing up, I turn to face the village proper. Well, I'm heading back down now. But before I leave, I want to offer a word of caution. What is it? She asked while rising to her feet behind me. Take a look around. From up here, the village might present a unified front, but don't let it fool you. Not every leaf nin is on a side, I stated. You're saying there are traders in our forces. The alarm was apparent in her voice. Does Lady Tsunade know about them? I suppose you could call them traitors. And she has her suspicions. What are we doing about them? Well, it is a given that any outside force would seek to plant spies within our borders. But it isn't those that I worry about. It's the rogue aspects within our command structure. Not everyone is happy with the current state of things. If that's the case, why not Kai eliminate them? She asked stumbling over the last part. Because they are not without support. They have been around for some time, and there is no telling where their roots don't reach. Even the Anbu could be compromised. The Hokage's own forces, yes. I'm telling you this for two reasons. One, because I want you to be alert and remember that information is crucial in the shinobi world. Especially that about one's abilities. You, you want me to keep my progress a secret. It's for the best. As you already know, I'm a high-profile target for various reasons. I said looking over my shoulder and catching a look flash across her face. Therefore, I'm already doing my best to limit what they get on me. As an old teammate, it wouldn't be wrong to assume they could have an eye on you as well. I'll do my best as well. She nodded, so this is why you have been so tight-lipped about your training. You're afraid of someone creating countermeasures for you. Partly. Like I said, information is key. That is one theme that was prevalent during the latter part of the series. One didn't need to look very hard to see it, Shikamaru defeating an S-class ninja. The link of manipulation going from Black Setsu to Madara to Obito, and then to Pain and the Akatsuki, all could be explained by having or lacking certain information. So, as of now, no one where I stood exactly. Danzo, if he was as competent as he liked to pretend, likely knew I was strong. But not how big of a threat I actually was. Those outside the village knew even less. And I like it that way. Secondly, there are ongoing attempts at filling up the open space left by Sasuk. I continued, they are trying to force Tsunade's hand to place their own agent in our team. But you have your own task for now, Sakura pointed out. Meaning the team isn't active yet, and therefore they have to wait two months before they can make something like that official. Right, I nodded. But if it does go through, we would have a spy at best or an assassin among us. She finished to which I affirmed. According to Tsunade, Danzo wanted to place someone around our age into the team. I automatically guessed it would be Sai. But realistically, the cripple could have various people who meet that requirement working under him. And even if it was Sai, I don't think I have the right personality to sway him to the light side like Naruto did. That's just not my thing. Without that factor, Sai would basically be a robot carrying out orders from a hypocritical old man, and that's not the type of person I want around me. Sakura would undoubtedly feel something off about the guy, but extra warning shouldn't hurt. I really hope Lady Tsune doesn't let that happen, Sakura said worriedly. When did internal village affairs become so out of sync? Is it really so surprising? Just this week you found out something the whole village had been keeping a secret. I would think this much easier to manage as compared to learning that your parents have been lying to you for the last decade. Honestly, corruption and humanity went hand in hand, I guess. Hey Naruto, I want to. Um, I waited while she tried to find the correct words to express herself, but after a few false starts, decided that I could meet her halfway. Sakura, if you're trying to say what I think you are, then it's okay. Perhaps okay is not the right word, but we all said and did things we now regret while we were young, and I won't hold it against you. Not when you seem genuinely sorry. I meant it. As a layback sort of person, I didn't really hold grudges. In this world with past transgressions against Naruto being passed on to me, I had decided to bury them for the most part. I didn't care enough about the general public to let them have any hold over me. Not when those negative emotions could lead to really bad consequences if not controlled. And I am. I said so many hurtful things and hit you so many times. I was horrible to you while you took it all with a smile. No one ever defended you because they saw you as some kind of monster. Even my own parents, which rubbed off on me. Her eyes were red with tears waiting to be shed. I need to apologize Naruto. Even if only for my sake to get this weight off my chest. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for taking advantage of how nice you were and putting you down. I'm sorry for making your life harder than it already was. I'm sorry for everything I did to hurt you. Looking at me the way she was, almost pleadingly. I didn't doubt her sincerity. Placing a hand on her shoulder, I said my next words hoping she would take heed of them. I forgive you Sakura. Letting the tears fall at last, she stepped closer and wrapped her arms around me in a tight hug. Returning the gesture, 
I noted how awkward I felt doing this. Not the hug, but rather the idea behind it. It just didn't feel right when I knew the person she should really apologize to was not here anymore. For now, all I could do was give her the chance to unload. Kusa everyone looks down on the Byakugan as being the weakest of the three Dejutsu, and they're technically not wrong. One of the others lets you copy hand seals, create Jinjutsu via eye contact, and unlock even crazier abilities. And that eye is considered the weaker precursor to the third one. But the white eye is certainly not useless. As long as you don't mind the bulging veins around the eyes, it allows for a visual range of several kilometers. X-ray vision that still makes no sense to me, and telescopic sight. Not too bad. It's definitely something that I could benefit from with my preference for assassination techniques. My sensing capabilities served me well enough I suppose. Sitting under the shade of a tree while molding the natural energy around me to my needs. I was more than aware of the two signatures a few kilometers out and slowly coming closer. One was dimmer than the other, no doubt Orochimaru angling for the surprise attack. I feel it as the first one reaches the point I had designated ahead of their arrival, and knew the moment had come. It was show time. Kirama, do it. I made a hand seal that I hadn't needed to in quite some time, and felt my partner do the same. Ninja Art. Ash Dash Shadow Clone Jutsu. My chakra surged to answer my call, maneuvering in ways it had grown accustomed to. As it moved in my pathways, something accompanied it. The two energies combined and left my Tenketsu points to form an almost perfect copy of myself. The same black attire covering everything below the neck. Same armor covering the torso and forearms. Same blonde hair and whiskers. Typical me in every sense. But in the middle of the orange pigment, the clone's eyes were a vivid red. Such a strange sensation, he grumbled looking down at a clenched fist. Although different, the sheer power in this form is substantial. There was also that. His voice was nothing like mine. Really, one would think his voice would change to reflect the different body however. It remained just as powerful. Were I a lesser man, I might have felt jealous. The satisfaction of a jutsu working on the first try kept me strong. That's probably the natural energy. Trust me, my baseline is nowhere near that level I stood up and started walking away. Try not to have too much fun. I could have said good luck, but that wasn't a factor here. We called this technique the shadow clone because that's what it was, essentially. It had a conscious just like a regular one. But in this case, Kirama was taking the driver's seat by sending his mind into the clone. Similar to the Yamanaka, his body didn't move. But he was possessing the clone which came with all the benefits. He had my innate familiarity of a bipedal form, along with all my techniques at his command. And on top of that was the natural energy. No, the one in need of luck was Kabuto in this case. Maybe Kami would have mercy on him, because Kurama definitely wouldn't. Taking a roundabout path and arrow stepping over the wide trench. I focus my mind on the matter at hand. Kabuto would be engaged near the bridge while I would attack Orochimaru from the side. That would be Kurama's go ahead to engage while I dealt with my opponent. My first strike was set to kill a regular shinobi, but the old snake was beyond that point now. So instead it would function to further separate the two sound in and force him to shed his skin. From there, it was simply a matter of killing him multiple times until he assumed his true form and then die permanently. That was the gist of the plan. Start with him on the back foot and keep it that way. There were too many unknowns about his abilities to specify further with any accuracy. Although physically inferior, he was a Sanin, a survivor of two wars and countless scuffles since leaving the Leaf, which included a stint with the Akatsuki. Altogether, he had more experience fighting and winning than both of my lives combined. Hence, a certain degree of respect was warranted. I lost nothing by taking him seriously, and so I would. Reaching an optimal position, I turned off the arc I had made and sprinted towards Orochimaru. My senses register the terrain and wildlife seemingly frozen in place as I navigate among the trees. Within seconds, the distance had been closed and I was on the ground inside his guard. Planting a fort, I bled my momentum and power into a spinning kick into his midsection. I could feel through my sandal his skin breaking and in its being liquefied as he was launched into a flight path just clearing the tree line. Pulsing my chakra, I leapt in pursuit. Quickly catching up I was able to take stock of his condition. His chest cavity was destroyed, but that wasn't the noteworthy observation. His skin was decaying, while his chakra presence seemed to be moving inwards. So that's how it worked. Huh? Well it's still too slow. Aiming my hand, a blue sphere of chakra formed and was fired into his center mass sending him crashing to the ground. A fireball was soon to follow, turning the impact zone into a pyre. Landing on a branch overlooking the site, I waited. That was the second time he cheaty tilted my head and allowed the blade to shoot past my ear from behind. Dropping from the branch, I again dodged a swipe that could have potentially beheaded me. Turning around, we made eye contact, slit pupils on bars. Naruto-kun, what an unpleasant surprise. He hissed, eyes narrowed. With his pale skin, reptilian eyes, and fang-like teeth, 
I could see why just his appearance would create fear. But unlike during the incident in the Forest of Death, he wasn't facing a weak Genin now. I take it dear old Sasori was defeated. Perhaps your leaf ninja aren't completely useless. He continued. I didn't bother responding. Instead, my eyes took in the blade in his hand. The Kusanagi. A legendary double-edged Jian that could cut through almost anything and extend using Chakra. I made up my mind to take it today. Especially after he went through the trouble of summoning it for me, rather than risk it disappearing with his death. Not getting a reaction, he switched tactics. It's such a shame Sasuke-kun isn't here. Witnessing the possibilities offered by Senjutsu, it would have driven him further into my control. Seems he, like everyone else, was working off outdated information. Sasuke was not a trigger word anymore, but I already realized his intention was to stall looking him dead in the eye. I raised one leg and smashed my foot into the ground, destroying it and the clone which had been creeping up to the surface. I didn't say anything, but I didn't have to. The gesture said it all. With a practice movement, a kunai fell into each hand, and then the slight haze of wind chakra swept over both, giving them a twirl. I shot forward. Our first clash saw Orochimaru being pushed back as my Senjutsu enhanced strength overwhelmed his. The second saw him redirecting my strike and mitigating the force behind it. After that, a pattern developed. One of deflecting and evading of flashing metal. I had doubts whether or not Sage Mode would protect me from the Kusanagi, so I dodged or parried each attack. All the same, I continued to advance as he shifted from the ground to among the treetops and back. A couple exchanges later and my opportunity came up. Locking his blade between my kunai, I channeled more chakra into them and with a flick of the wrist, sliced off of his hand with the extended wind blade. I allowed him to jump back as I grabbed the sword before gravity did. Tapping the hilt to my chest plate, I couldn't help but smirk as it was sealed away. That was easy. That out of the way. The delicate touch was no longer needed. I could get back to the plan of killing Orochimaru until it stuck. The same snake who was currently fleeing. Couldn't have that. Ignoring the trails of the mud clones. I followed the chakra presence I had memorized by now. Two seconds later, my flying knee turned a piece of wood into splinters. In the same movement, an air platform formed in front of my leading fort and was used to propel me out of the path of a wave of flames. Another aero step allowed me to dodge the huge serpent that burst from the ground in an attempt to swallow me. With little effort, water coalesced from the air to form a whip that I used to slice at the softer underbelly and dispel it. Orochimaru had ran using the snake as cover but I kept track of him. A body flicker and then a punch to the liver sent him careening through a number of trees before stopping. Once again, he came out of a crater free of injuries and another body shed. He ran through a set of hand seals and literally spat out thousands of snakes that flew towards me. I know shinobi have a number of jutsus that require spitting things out, but something about doing it with seemingly living snakes was just wrong. As such, I was more than happy to destroy them with a hurricane of swirling wind blades. Speeding forward again and molding chakra, I grabbed his hand from its path to slam on the ground and broke that wrist. My free fist then jabbed him in the stomach with considerable force, enough to cause internal damage, but not send him flying. When his inevitable reflex presented itself, I launched an original jutsu down his throat and leapt back. Checkmate. When release, liquid nitrogen was something that I created while experimenting with elemental chakra and temperature. The idea came to me after my success with the hot water bullet, after wind water had been my best trained affinity, and I thought it would be easiest to change its composition first. So that was accomplished and then I decided to head in the opposite direction, but with wind chakra. And thus, after a long time my clones did a field test of the cold gas jutsu, and I named it liquid nitrogen. It wasn't real ice release, but it was the next best thing. I had assumed it would be a good counter to Diodara and his explosives, which could range from microscopic to mushroom cloud big. But I think Chiraya's fist ended that experiment early. I had still used it on the cave, but that had mainly been in case he prepared some type of dead man's trap ahead of time. Either he hadn't or the jutsu was cold enough to prevent them from going off. I didn't really matter. It was certainly effective against Orochimaru. His current body was on all fours, gasping from asphyxiation and pain, as the jutsu had went down his throat and into his organs, instantly freezing what it touched and everything in the immediate area. I would imagine it a very painful yet quick way to go for a regular mortal. In this case, he had to shed his skin twice in quick succession, once to leave the flash frozen corpse which shattered after the act, and again to escape the frostbitten body that had to come in contact with the solid gas on the way out of his mouth. Reaching out a hand, the familiar buzz of the Rasen Shuriken built up and was waiting to go before he went through his final transformation. He had taken the form of a giant white snake made up of smaller snakes. It was obvious that shape wasn't meant for battle like this. It lacked the hands that ninja used to be most effective. Made sense it was used as the last resort. But the instant he was out, I hold the dense jutsu, and had it explode right after slicing him in two. The barrage of visible and cellular level wind blades, left his carcass as a bloody lump of flesh, all structural integrity lost. Feeling his presence fade from my senses, I allowed myself to relax somewhat. The fight hadn't lasted that long, but Orochimaru was a slippery one who had faked his death many times before, so I had been on the lookout for such tactics. This time was the real deal, 
However, the three Sanan had just became two. About time you got done, spoke my partner from beside me. It was Orochimaru. I shrugged even if not on our level. He was not someone who would go out without a fight. He almost used the impure world reincarnation near the end there. So that's what he was attempting. A sly one, the other did not amount to much. Next time, I'm fighting the superior opponent. Do you remember that you lost the coin flip? It's not my fault you ended up with four eyes. I laughed. But I don't have a problem with letting you pick first later on. Good. Here, I burned the rest of him. Laying in his hand was a sound forward protector and a pair of glasses with a broken lens. The same pair Kabuto would constantly adjust to do that light glaring off the glasses trick. I always assumed they were for that purpose alone. I doubt someone like him couldn't fix his eyesight. Taking and sealing them away. I turned back to the snake. I took his sword, so there's no point in digging around for his forehead protector. Then all that's left is cleanup. A thin stream of fire left his mouth to envelop the corpse. I snorted at this. Give a fox some ninjutsu, don't be surprised by how much he enjoys using them. Like getting a new game. Taking the cue, I created a dozen clones. A few went to round up the skin that had been shed, while the rest spanned out to find the snake's hideout. It was unlikely they had left a direct trail to their base on the way here, so we would have to search from the point I first felt them and outwards. So, nothing. He shook his head, not using my negative emotion sensing nor your radar. We were completely alone today. I didn't pick up anything either. Let's pray it's because there was nothing to find rather than them subverting our senses. I hadn't been certain if chakra sensing worked on any of the Zetsu, but searching through emotions, should have found them if they had indeed watched the battle. Either way, we've lost some of our advantage with this move. He commented while staring at the flames. Perhaps. But this was a calculated plan of action. We'll deal with the diverging plotline and whatever it throws at us. May it be better than the alternative. We had been working under the assumption that everything would go according to canon, or at least be guided by it. I didn't really remember what effect the two snake summoners had on the plot between the first encounter with Sasuke and the point where Orochimaru was killed. Maybe something minor, maybe not. Fact was, they were dead, and anything could result from that change. But that was the risk when doing something bold. And we weren't done changing the script just yet. We're done here. On to the next step. He smiled. The anticipation was clear. Yup. You want to stay out or should I summon you later? I'll remain in this form for a while longer. He answered before leaping away. I saw that coming. I don't have the time nor expertise to reverse engineer a key to the barrier seal. I wasn't too prideful to admit it. I was decent at few injutsu and could accomplish novel things with it. But I was no prodigy with the art. So hacking and entering through the main entrance was a no-go. But we weren't without options. Waiting until the dead of night. After I had felt the single source of emotion inside Dampen, we improvised. Moving around until we were near the sleeping target but not right on top of them. I used my new sword to burrow into the dirt and passed the layer of rock until I felt no resistance. After twisting the kusanagi around some, I pulled it out and was left with a tunnel roughly the width of the blade in diameter. It was perfect for what I had in mind. Sitting down, I took out a storage scroll and unfurled it. Applying chakra to the seal released a kit with various medicinal tools and supplements. From that I took out the small purple capsule, which held a general anesthetic agent. Holding it in my palm, I channeled my chakra. Slowly, air gathered to form a sphere with the capsule at its center. Moving my hand away left it looked like the pellet was floating in place. Clasping my hands together in the bird hand sign, the sphere obeyed my demand, and quickly constricted and expanded back to its previous size. That pressure was enough to rupture the capsule, and purple smoke filled the sphere, allowing the naked eye to see the shape of the wind construct. Now came the hard part. Before our eyes, the air bubble sunk to the ground and entered the tunnel I had formed. Following the path to its end point, it exited into an area that was likely another room based on the air pressure. Annoying. I had been aiming for a hallway, so this just created more work. Even with sage mode enhancing my control, this manipulation of wind chakra was not easy. Closing my eyes to further concentrate, I had the bubble move around in the room until I felt the area where the air in the room was intermingling with that of the corridor. Forcing it against the door, the shape of the bubble distorted as it squeezed its way between the door and the frame piecemeal until it popped back into shape on the other side. Guiding it forward towards the only chakra signature, I once again had to feel out a shift in pressure signifying a door and then push the bubble into the crevice. Now in the right room, it was child's play to maneuver the bubble over the target and have it disperse releasing the gas. Back outside, I slumped in relief. That was a real test of my abilities. Didn't even want to consider just how long it would have taken in my base form without the boost in control and passive sensing to guide my technique. Too long. Good job. Kirama patted my shoulder. I'll handle the capture. Yup, all you. I nodded while packing up the health kit. Two clones popped into existence and using the malleability of being chakra constructs transformed into large beetles that crawled down the tunnel. Moments later, they fled chakra as a signal. 
A couple substitutions later, Kurama and I stood in a dark room with the only bit of light coming from the sides of a door. Feeling for the doorknob, it was of course locked. So it got slashed to pieces. Stepping out into the hallway, I took a look around. The walls were made from a clay-like material shaped in old swirling panels. Candles hung from the walls in regular intervals, casting light and shadows at different areas. Not the most comfortable of hideouts. Actually, if the desired outcome was something similar to an Egyptian tomb, then the interior designer succeeded. Horrible taste aside, I followed Kurama as he walked over to the only occupied room, and simply opened the door. Forming some hand seals as he approached the bed, Chakra gathered on his hand which he slapped onto the target's head, leaving a Chakra restricting seal. And just like that, Sasu Kachiha had been neutralized. All it took was some stealth, knockout gas, and a tailed beast putting a seal on him. The irony. Well Kurama, stopping beside him to run an eye over the Avenger, Looks like you finally got one over in a chiha. This one is nothing compared to the other two. He hasn't truly annoyed me for one. He snorted. Bringing out the med kit and getting to work, I replied back. Yeah, but that's an unfair comparison at the moment. Remember that in less than six months he would have won against 3S ranks, attained the Eternal Manjikyu, and then the Rinnegan. Pulling the needle out of Sasuke's arm, I detached it from the full vial which I carefully placed into the kit. Matter of fact, even after double teaming Kagaya, he had enough left in the tank to capture all the loose tail beasts in a Jinjutsu and seal them in individual Chibaki Tensei formations. Ship Pudin moved slowly from my perspective of watching it, but when I really crunched the numbers, the pace was astronomical. In what I estimate to be less than a year, Naruto went from struggling against Kakashi to being able to create hundreds of clones, each strong enough to defeat cages. And Sasuke who had a more impressive first showing, had a similar power creep. Even if they were handed some of that power, it's still insane. That's why when I consider my strength and progress over the years, I try not to allow my ego to inflate too much. It was impressive, yes. But it wasn't the greatest feat. ECH? That was the other timeline. No one will use me like that ever again. And it's only a matter of time before I can repay that pretender. He growled, which was weird when he was wearing my visage. And having to imagine his face behind mine while using that jutsu. I just realized that Kurama didn't have whiskers. That little detail was not terribly important. But it still made me wonder why I had them. Another mystery in this life his eyes then locked onto something else. Hopefully that takes effect faster than when Madara did it. Yeah and that it provides something on the same scale. I agreed looking at them too. A vial of blood, a couple hairs, and a bit of flesh. The things that would set me on a path to reaching new heights. Like the ultimate Achiha, I wanted to awaken the six parts chakra on my own. Due to only the Indra reincarnate having achieved it before, neither of us knew what to expect. It wouldn't be the Rinnegan because I didn't take Sasuke's eyes, and it probably wouldn't be six parts sage mode because I didn't have the ten tails chakra. Besides those two outcomes, there was nothing else in particular that Hagoromo was known for. If it wouldn't give me that sage mode, then I was personally hoping for beyond Hashirama level life force and regeneration, plus a unique bloodline. Just something that matches being able to summon meteors or rip out souls. That and for it to activate before I left my prime behind. Unless unlocking it would reverse all the wear and tear of old age. I'm done. Taking a spool of ninja wire, I made quick work of restraining him. Made from durable metal fibers, he wouldn't be escaping them anytime soon without access to his chakra network. Hefting him up and over a shoulder, we left the small room to find somewhere more suitable for a conversation like expected. The base was void of life besides Sasuk. It wasn't surprising, but after seeing how large and detailed it was, I couldn't help but think Orochimaru had it built simply because he could. Similar to the wealthy owning multiple houses or vehicles. Maybe my poor opinion of it arose from the lack of critical information. I hadn't banked everything on it, but I had come with the loose expectation of finding some documents in the base. That would corroborate my outsider knowledge. Damning evidence against Danzo showing his dealings with Orochimaru set aside in advance in case the cripple ever betrayed the snake. Or perhaps information on the Akatsuki members that Orochimaru had interacted with before being chased away. Anything of that sort really. But of course stuff like that was noticeably missing from what I had recovered. Instead I had found things like notes about inhumane experiments going on in different hideouts and various cadavers. Even then, the details were not presented in a way that would help in locating these other bases. Luckily for me, I had someone who had likely visited a few of them, and could be persuaded to rat them out. Speaking of Sasuke, a number of the notes found were about him, his training regimen and the cocktail of substances that were developed for him. Lack of morals aside, the snake had seemingly used all the resources at his disposal to strengthen his next vessel. They were carefully prepared and administered to get the best results, so Sasuke wouldn't have to worry about strange side effects at all. I'm sure Tsune can make use of them. Perhaps make a few tweaks, and then make them available to leaf forces, preferably after Danzo was dealt with. Which we could have started working on if the snake had kept a few memories of the past laying about. I can only hope the information I am looking for exists, otherwise I may have to commit forgery. A shift in empathy draws my attention to the youngest Achiha. Confusion. Fear. 
determination. Despite becoming somewhat aware of his current situation, he made no external movements. I could almost feel his mind going from zero to a hundred while calculating ways to escape, all while not letting his captors know he was conscious. Like a true shinobi, I expected no less from someone trained by Orochimaru. I know you're awake. I adjusted my posture. There was no response, but slowly, bending at the waist, he sat up off the ground. After almost three years, black eyes locked onto blue. They then darted around taking in my position sitting on a raised platform in front of a giant snake head and the extra candles that I had lit around the room. His gaze rested temporarily on the kusanagi held between my hands before returning to mine. While he was doing that, I took notice of how his white top basically left his chest open to attacks. I don't quite think he had reached a level where physical protection was optional. What are you playing at Orochimaru? Sasuke glared. I was momentarily confused before I realized what was going on. With a flick I had the blade pointing at him before having it extend and zip past his neck, leaving a shallow wound. This is no mere Jinjutsu Sasuke, and you are not hallucinating. Willing the sword back to its natural length, I sealed it away. It had only been present to make a point. Hello Sasuke, it's been a while, hasn't it? Naruto. I watched his eyes widen before he started struggling with his restraints. No, I will not be brought back like this. You hear me Naruto I will not allow it. I don't think you are in any position to state such a thing. Your chakra has been sealed, you're not going anywhere unless I decide so. I replied. Then release me, he shouted. You have no right to do this to me. You abandoned the village, Sasuke. Several of our comrades were harmed trying to bring you back. And you stuck a hand into my chest. I didn't ask to be brought back. He refuted. I made my choice to pursue my goal. They made theirs. Please don't do this Naruto. As someone with their own dreams. Don't take mine away. Not after what I did for you. Did for me, you say. Wait. Did he actually believe I defeated you and could have killed you? But I didn't. I let you live so you have no right to intervene with my goal. Returning me to Kanohu will be the end for me. So let me go like I let you go at the valley. Huh. He actually thinks he did me a favor. Even after driving its Shidori into my chest I don't know if Naruto really died from that incident, or if it was an unfortunate coincidence when my presence overrode his. But he's no longer here, and I doubt anything Sasuke did was beneficial. So his argument held no sway over me. Even more so because I did not plan to return him to the leaf just yet, he could end up playing an important role. It's not that easy, I said. I made a promise to bring you back even if you had to come kicking and screaming. Then I'll come back myself. After I've killed my brother, he replied instantly. Let me go now and after Itachi is dead, I will return to Kanoha. You have my word. I let the proposal sit in the air for a moment before replying. And why would I do that, Sasuke? Why risk it? The Akatsuki are after those like you. People who have tail beasts in them. If I get my way, Itachi will die leaving you with one less threat to worry about. It would benefit us both. He outlined. My presence here along with the Kusanagi would suggest that Orochimaru was dead. I started taking into consideration that I easily defeated him. What makes you think I worry about the Akatsuki? Answer me that, Shen. That fool wasn't the strongest member in the organization. They had a leader. A leader. Yes. A leader and other strong shinobi. He didn't speak of them often, but he made secret bases and countermeasures for a reason. Is what he finally went with. Not at all useful, but it led to my real demand well enough. I stood up and moved to steps closer, causing his jaw to clench. You're not wrong, Sasuke. I do have a certain empathy for you and your dreams of vengeance. So, I will accept your promise of coming willingly after the deed is done, but I want something else right now. Which is, in return for freeing you, I want the location of every hideout you know of. Big, small, empty, occupied, I want them all. Do that and you will be allowed to pursue Itachi. I offered looking him straight in the eye, just that. Simple hideouts. I nodded once. After some mental deliberation, he relented. Fine. I have been to Dashno. Moving quickly, I brought out a map and writing utensil and freed one of his arms. Marked down them. Taking the proffered pen, he jotted down four different locations, with one spaced out further from the rest. He looked at me when he had finished. But I knew better. You can't hide your deceit from me, Sasuke. I said all of them. He hesitated before making one last notation. I've done what you asked for so unseal my chakra. He all but demanded. The seal will come off in a minute or so, making sure I had everything placed away. I went to leave before pausing. One last thing. I plan to deal with the Akatsuki sooner rather than later. If you waste time, you just might lose your chance at your brother. I thought about making a threat about going back on our deal but decided otherwise. With my piece said, I began walking to the exit where his voice reached me. What are you going to do with those locations? Hum, was that worry for his future team members perhaps? I'm sure the Hokage would appreciate having the location of these five bases. I'll turn them over to her. I look forward to our next encounter Sasuke. And with that I left the room. Once in the hallway and out of Sasuke's sight, I nodded to Kurama who made a hand seal to disperse the chakra restricting seal. With his chakra back and an arm free, he should soon be able to escape the ninja wire, 
There are plenty of tricks for that after all. Giving Kurama the map and a custom storage scroll. I made three clones who quickly transformed into nondescript ninjas in black attire and plain masks. Taking the cue, my partner transformed as well. I leave the rest up to you. I told him. I don't know if he plans to form his team again, but it's best if you hurry. Red Eyes glanced over the other clones before looking back at me. Got it. Safe travels. Thanks. Good hunting. The next few seconds saw us blowing a hole in the ceiling and escaping into the light of dawn. I was heading back to the village while they would go looking for the different bases. The hope was that they would find and search them all by the time I reported back to Tsunade in a day. It would really help in circumventing any anger she feels about this stunt. Seeing how far Kurama's mind could extend away from his body was why he had accompanied my clones. The results from this test would factor into later plans. Running over the barren land, the events of the past 24 hours swirled around in my head. There were things that could have been changed, but in the end, it was a day of repeat successes. Kabuto was dead along with his master. Although I could have tried to obtain the location of the Shinigami mask, I knew he wouldn't have easily given it up. Not when he likely knew I was going to end him either way. And dealing with Sasuke had been the most important event, okay? Likely second most important when considering the return of Madara and Kagaya. But he was up there, not only for his DNA, but also to guide him down a certain route. The ideal outcome was him finding Itachi and learning the real reasons for the Ichiha massacre from his mouth, rather than someone else. From there they would likely fight, and Itachi would die by Sasuke's hand like he intended, and then Sasuke would return to the leaf. In this scenario he wouldn't have been used by Abita to attack B, nor the Cage Summit, and wouldn't be branded a criminal by every nation. Everyone would be better off in this hypothetical outcome. Everyone but Abito, but that's perfectly fine. Sasuke Chiho once again found his hand being forced by factors out of his control. First it had been his own brother slaying every member of their clan except him. Then it had been Orochimaru putting a curse seal on him, and tempting him with power, and most recently another person had thrown his plans into disarray. Of course, he hadn't been completely without choice regarding the second occurrence, but it had made sense in his mind. Kanoha was keeping him from his potential. Therefore, he would use the pitiful snake who had asinine dreams of taking his body, and then kill him. Before the might of an Achiha, Orochimaru would be nothing more than a stepping stone. After that he would have formed a team to help track down Itachi, and then prevent interference while he avenged his clan. Said plan had to be adjusted now. Hello Sasuke, it's been a while, hasn't it? Naruto Uzumaki, his old teammate who had graduated bottom of the class but had proven to be more than meets the eye. Yet despite his hidden strength, Sasuke would never have foreseen what transpired in that base. You're not going anywhere unless I decide so. That Naruto was not the same one he left barely clinging to life at the Valley of the End. The new one had been confident and collected as he laid down the ultimatum. And why wouldn't he be? He had managed to sneak in and place Sasuke in a disadvantageous position from the very beginning, and from there the tone had been set. It was only his pride that had prevented him from openly pleading to be allowed free. His very dream had been at stake after all. Yet, although he had gotten away, he couldn't help but feel as if he had been toyed with. Without his Sharingan, it was hard to analyze the situation with the clarity he was accustomed to. But he felt positive that Naruto had been pleased by the final outcome. Something that made him see as he reflected on that event. To be played like a fool it would never happen again. He knew just the deterrent to prevent it. With that he put on a burst of speed to arrive at his destination faster. With the possibility of leaf forces coming after the hideouts, time was of the essence. Finally, he thought as the water-based southern hideout came into view. But the sensation of relief did not last for long. This base was used to hold prisoners for whatever reasons a Ruchimaru might need of them. As such, they were kept behind bars at all times. That was not the case at the moment, various people could be seen milling about on the island. Their white rags denoted their status. As Sasuke walked from the water to the underground entrance, the recently freed prisoners made a path for him. None looked eager to interact with the obvious shinobi. That reaction persisted as he made his way deeper into the hideout. They would take notice of him, and immediately back away in fear. Seeing one area where the ex-prisoners had gathered and were making noise, he went to investigate. A few steps away from the crowd, someone in the back saw him and with wide eyes nudged his neighbor. Looking over and then behind him, his cry of shinobi went up, and the group dispersed leaving the door they had been attempting to break down. Sharingan blazing, Sasuke stepped up to the door which opened as he got close enough, and a figure leapt out at him. It was only the fact that he recognized the person and had come for them specifically that stayed his hand. Sasuke Kun, you came for me, exclaimed Karen as she buried her face in the crook of his neck. Shen, he ignored the way she was inhaling his scent. Karen, what happened here? Had the leaf raided the base already? And if so, why leave Karen who was an underling of Orochimaru? Do we have to talk about that just yet? Can't we stay like this for a while? She asked tightening her arms around him. He didn't say anything and just pushed her off. Fine. She huffed but came back to stand in his personal space. A squad of ninja invaded the base earlier. They were dressed like black ops, 
and had no visible signs of allegiance to any village. They swept through the hideout taking all the notes and scrolls laying around before freeing the prisoners and leaving. Sasuke pondered that for a moment. That attack happening hours after Naruto got the location from him was oddly convenient. That meant Kanoha was responsible. But how did they respond so fast? Or maybe, did you pick up any details as to their identities or motive? He inquired. They had large chakra signatures. Each had more than Lord Orochimaru. They were also similar in a way. Three of them felt like the sun, threatening to destroy anything that came too close. The fourth one, I don't know how to describe it. Potent like the others yet more eager. Sasuke gave her an expectant look, asking her to keep going. They arrived so fast, one second everything was fine, and then the next these monster chakra signatures were there. They were all sensors. I felt them when they activated their techniques. Usually I can hide from that type of detection, but one of them found me. I, I thought I was going to be killed. The memory of that chakra bearing down on her still raised goosebumps on her skin. She took a breath before hesitantly continuing. He asked me about the location of other hideouts, and I, I gave them. I didn't want to, but I was terrified. Sasuke watched the usually confident girl shake in her shoes, and found that he could not blame her for that display of weakness. Not after he himself had been brought low by the same person he suspected attacked the base using his clones. And he at least had had the assurance that his old teammate would not kill him. Although, wasn't taking someone's dream away essentially killing them. That doesn't matter anymore Karen. Orochimaru is dead. The different hideouts and even the escaped prisoners no longer serve a purpose. He said once she had gathered herself. Is that really true? She questioned. One of them said that to the prisoners. But I thought it was just to make them stop cowering in their cells. And of course, after they left those unwashed brutes tried to attack me. Like, I was the one who locked them up. She fumed in her typical way. Yes, I saw the proof. He left it at that. But Lord Orochimaru had taken so many precautions. Could he really be dead? She wasn't close to him. She doubted even Kabuto would be considered as close to his master. But she knew that at least. The snake summoner had been addicted to his pursuit of immortality. It doesn't matter if he survived. He's gone now and I'm moving on to what I joined him for. Turning off his Sharingan, he looked her in the eye. I'm forming a team to help me find Itachi. I want you in it Karen. Kanoha left swipe. Left swipe. Waste of time. Next. Left swipe. Oh, this one looks important. It was a lengthy document. It had drawn my eye from its position in the stack and gotten me curious about what it could be. Not many would choose to create something this time consuming without first gauging interest. But I see why they might feel confident in gaining approval. On the front was a familiar symbol and a title. Following was an overview and beneath that was signatures from the headmaster of the academy, along with various instructors, Aruka's name being the second on the list. Color me intrigued. Putting my time as a student to good use. I quickly skimmed all the pages, and then gently placed it down. Things really are changing, huh? And it wasn't even due to anything I did this time. I looked at the proposal submitted to the Hokage's desk again. It seemed Aruka and his teacher friends wanted to make the academy curriculum more wholesome, introduce students to various ninja arts before graduation, and even work on chakra control techniques up to tree walking. I could definitely see the benefits of a move like this. But it would also require more effort to be put in by the instructors and students. Easily worth it if the goal is to have quality genin enter the force each year. Of course, that was the positive way of looking at it. My world would have seen it differently. Differently. More efficient child soldiers. Built different or not, most genin still started their careers around age 12. It's simply how things are done, but at least now they might have slightly better odds in the field. Did this also happen in the original timeline? Perhaps in the background, picking up the document, I placed it in the pile on the right, which consisted of one other proposal from the seals and barrier department. A department I was starting to grow familiar with. Looking to the left, the pile of documents that I found to be of little importance was at least 4 centimeters high. And the pile still unsorted, twice as tall. Oak. She called it preparation for one day running this office. But both of us know what she meant, she hadn't been too thrilled when I brought back news of engaging Orochimaru and Kabuto alone. And this was the punishment. Helping her get through all her paperwork by prioritizing the documents that weren't classified into a pile. That should be attended too soon and another for the useless ones. After the third day of doing this, I could say that the number of requests and forms of various types sent to the Hokage was honestly absurd. Yes, she was the head of the village and had final say, but some of these things had no need to come this far up the chain of command. Reaching for the next document, I was very aware of the time barely moving. And that's that, just in time for lunch. Raising her arms above her head and yawning, several cracks could be heard as her spine adjusted. Or, Shizun. Brat, what do you want to eat? I'm in the mood for some chicken breasts. That sounds fine my lady. Naruto-kun. I grunted in assent from my position slumped over the little workstation they had arranged for me to the side of Tsunade's desk. Chicken breasts it is. Perhaps with cooked brown rice on the side. Of course. Cat. A figure dropped from the ceiling and took a knee. 
Get my regular and two of Shizun's from the Akimichi's place. You know the one. Switch the sate with water please. Shizun added. Again with that. Whatever, no sate cat. With a crisp high the Anbu left the room. You know, a little bit of alcohol here. And there won't affect my duties. Their serving size wouldn't even get me tipsy. She grumbled. It's the principle behind the act Lady Tsunade. And besides, what kind of example would that be setting for Naruto-kun here? I looked up at the two of them. What not to do as the hokage. She shrugged her shoulders. Way ahead of you. A small laugh left my lips. Rule number one. Don't become the hokage while young. Rule number two. Don't become responsible for the paperwork. At least not personally. I don't think it works like that Naruto-kun. But if there's one person who could manage to get around the paperwork, it would be you. I am pretty amazing. Huh? I preened while she laughed. But I'm sure Tsunade here could actually use a clone to take some of the stress off. I pointed out, of course I could, she snorted, but to maintain it for any useful period of time would require me to activate my seal. Going that far for something so trivial is just idiotic. And Shizun also wouldn't allow it. I smirked, cutting straight to the heart of the matter. No, she wouldn't. Tsunade sighs and sends her apprentice a side glance personally. I think this is her revenge for all the years she had to put up with my antics. With the drinking and whatnot. Lady Tsunade. I would never do such a thing. Using that stockpile chakra on a little paperwork is just a bad idea. You never know when you might need it so better safe than sorry. Is it me? Or does that bright smile feel a little too bright? Guess playing nanny to a grown woman can get to even the nicest of people. To treat your poor sensei this way, after all I did for you. I'm heartbroken Shizun, absolutely devastated. A hand was placed onto her oversized chest while she shed crocodile tears. Good thing Sakura would never betray me like that. I'm only looking out for your best interest, my lady. Shizun doubled down. Obviously not, otherwise you wouldn't have denied me my sake. It's the only thing that keeps me going when faced with these physical constructs of misery. What I wouldn't give to learn how Sensei managed for so long with this hat, it was probably whatever he was smoking in that pipe of his. I offered to their amusement. That had been a theory of mine while watching the Anime. Here is in resorting to reading smut and getting higher self-care. Hilarious. He always did like that pipe. Tsunade remembered with fondness in her voice. He first picked up the habit after grandfather and granduncle died. After that, I don't think a day went by where the damned thing wasn't on him. Used to drive me insane. Yeah. It was present till the very end. I agreed. Did that thing survive the fight against Orochimaru? Seems like the oddest things last the longest. So, Naruto-kun, any of those documents going straight to Tsunade-sama? Silently thanking Shizun for breaking the atmosphere before it could set, I reached for one of the piles to hand to her. Yeah, luckily for her there are only six of them. The rest can either be sent to different departments or placed at the bottom of her stack. Taking them and running an eye over the forms, she hummed in though as one caught her attention. Aruka-sensei is certainly living up to his promise. She noted. The academy sent in another request. Let me see that. While she read through the 22-page proposal, I sent an inquisitive look at Shizun. Tsunade had said another, hadn't she? Shortly after you left, Aruka-sensei came to us and voiced his desire to revamp the academy and what it taught its students. Getting his fellow sensei along with the headmaster together, the first request was sent in about two years ago. It was designed to be the foundation that later changes would be built upon. Shizun explained. What did that one do? Created mandatory psychological evaluations for students before joining the academy, and then at the end of each year, she smiled at my expression. I know. Those evaluations were normally reserved for Anbu or those in positions of leadership, so to ask children to take them was quite the maneuver on their part. Yeah. I can't imagine it was easy to pass. What is that information used for? I had a few ideas myself. On the surface level, to instill the right mindset. I'm sure you can see it for yourself looking back Naruto-kun, but very few Genin graduate from the academy, both knowing and understanding what the leaf headband represents. Rather than expect the Jonin instructors or negative experiences to show them how dangerous the ninja career is, the academy will now work to ensure that each student has the correct mentality going forward. Those who feel that path is not for them can decide that early and quit before coming to that realization, after something that happens in the field. You seem passionate about this topic, Shizun. It wasn't too obvious, but the signs were there. The narrowed eyes, slightly higher volume and cadence, and even her posture. I just prefer to not receive more patients who were crippled or disfigured before getting over their misconceptions. She defended herself, watching her force the tension out of her body. I couldn't prevent the small smile on my lips. Tsune did well to keep this kind soul close to her. Nothing wrong with a little passion. She coughed and broke eye contact. It might lead to lower retention rates, but I agree with you. Doing evaluations could certainly be useful. Those kids deserve to know what they are signing up for. How would events have transpired if Naruto had known what it would take to become the Hokage? To really understand what a shinobi was and what they did, and then to realize that the cage was expected to be capable in all those fields. Even his hero, the fourth Hokage, only got the position after slaughtering a whole platoon of Iowa troops and winning a war for Kanoha. Naruto had been able to gloss over that fact, 
But what if he had been required to acknowledge it? Would his desire to be acknowledged and loved himself be enough motivation to continue on the shinobi route? And if it hadn't, would his status as a Jinchuriki have allowed him to choose a different path? That right there would have made for an interesting story. Stepping past the threshold, I shut the door behind me. My footwear was quickly removed and placed beside the pair of Jedi sandals. Next to come off was the cloak which went onto a hook like the others. With those social niceties observed, I walked into the kitchen and came out a minute later with a bottle and two platters, filling them up to different levels. I placed the heavier platter along with the bottle on one end of the table and then took my place at the other. I took a few small sips while my guest slowly drained his. Drinking had never been and still wasn't my thing, but I could put up with small quantities every now and then. It also wouldn't be proper to offer him a drink while not touching mine. Someone who didn't know me might suspect poison or something. For a moment the only sound in the room was that of sake being consumed, and the clacking of objects being moved around. He wasn't always that way. Jureya finally sighed. There was a time when I was proud to call him my teammate. I sat up straight and pushed my platter away. Of course. The legendary Sanin, one of Kanoha's greatest three men cells. After the cages, you three had the biggest sections in our history books. It was that same greatness that tore us apart. He replied bitterly, we were the most capable. Whenever something important needed to be done they would send us. Always in the very thick of things. So much violence, death, despair. One couldn't go through it all and come out the same. It changed each of us. And Orochimaru was changed the most. My head tilted. Many would think that, but in all honesty, I believe it only intensified his inner fears. You need only go on so many missions, kill so many people, see so many comrades die, before you start becoming numb to it, and wonder when your time will run out. And hence, his quest to become a mortal and learn every jutsu possible. Almost the same concept as that other snake-themed, noseless villain. Unfortunately, he became the monster people will always remember him as. He reached out for the bottle and upended the rest into his container. That thing ran out faster than I was anticipating. Shen, you know, in a way, unhappy that you were the one to put a stop to his crimes. He took a long pull, fond memories, long past and outweighed by the horrors I've seen caused by him. But yes, we had the others back so often, Tsunades as well, that I would have found myself conflicted over doing it. Would have done it, as was my duty. But afterwards, I can only imagine, bringing up the platter a final time. The one bottle of sake I kept in the apartment was done away with. For a long time he was out in the world, doing evil deeds for the sake of curiosity. I would be plagued at night knowing that he was always out of my reach. That every day I didn't catch him, someone else was paying the price. I owed it to the hundreds of innocents to do something, but I always fell short. Now however, since it was a pupil of mine who carried out the act, I'd like to think I played a part in finally ridding the world of him. And knowing you, his end was quick. More than many others would have given him. More than he likely deserved. The last part came in a whisper. But I heard it all the same. That was an opinion that most people would have agreed with. Well, I wasn't really doing it for you. But I'm happy to have taken a weight off your shoulders. And I can't really say I regret killing him. But I'm sorry you had to lose a friend. No matter how long ago it really happened. I shrugged, actually, I appreciate you not blowing up on me. What I did might seem reckless. One might say I should have retreated. But I had it well in hand. Just want to point that out in case you think a reprimanding is due. Jureya let out a little chuckle and shook his head. That's just her way of showing she cares. With the few precious people she has left, you can't really blame her for being upset at what she sees as reckless behavior. If you didn't keep making excuses and just show her what you can do. I know, and I really did. Poor woman lost her family, lover, and basically her entire clan to violence. Screw that last bit though. I'm not doing a practical demo until Scar Chin is gone. Sigh, I'm just complaining to complain. I don't really mind helping in the office that much. And Shizun usually stops by too. Ooh, you'd better be careful with her. He said sucking through his teeth, Sune will find a way to hurt you if you make her apprentice sad. Her favorite or not. I'm not some bastard. Waving aside his warning. I'll flirt with her, yes. But I would never lead her on or do something stupid like that. This world already treats genuinely kind people poorly. I'd rather not add to it. That didn't mean something happening between us was impossible though. Unlike the other really kind female I knew, Shizun was an adult and therefore not off limits. She only needed to show interest. And how dare he jump straight to that conclusion. I find the lack of faith disturbing. Good. You do not want to be on that side of her. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. The closest I've came to death was under that woman's fists. Whoa, slow down there. I'm not going to let you compare what you did and what you think I'm doing. There's a huge difference. What you did was stupid to the max. How the hell do you fall into the bath with her? What kind of ninja does that? I asked incredulously. That's a question I will forever ask myself. Perhaps some cruel god snapped that branch beneath me for a quick laugh. A lecherous smile crept over his face, punishment aside. The sight is permanently etched into my memory. It was worth it. 
I couldn't help but shake my head. That was the very definition of the high risk low reward. An idea hit me, maybe we could get a Yamanaka to dash never. The rejection was swift to come. Hey, I wouldn't have shared either. A heavy sigh tore through my fantasy of 106. I always figured I would be the first to die. Compared to those two I may as well have been a normal ninja. To think, the one who fought it the most was the first to fall. There really must be a cruel god out there. What else would explain this life we live? I couldn't fight back a sigh myself. Shireya and I were close, maybe it was a different dynamic than what Naruto and he had in canon. But that relationship was there all the same. We were bros. So it wasn't a surprise that we discussed philosophy at times, his goal in life was striving towards peace after all. I didn't mind since I appreciated intellectual conversation like anyone else. That it never failed to give me an old feeling to my stomach. All the talk about violence and suffering and wanting to put an end to it made me uncomfortable, because I was a lot less optimistic about a happily ever after than Jiraiya was. Not to say he wasn't somewhat jaded himself, but he didn't know what I knew. In short, that there was a sequel to this story. The less said about the possible origin of this story the better. Even if we get through this next year or so and all my plans work out perfectly, there were still threats lurking about, and I suspect that there always would be. That was the nature of this setting. One conflict after another leading to generation after generation either dealing with it or passing down the burden. I think it's safe to say very few people received happy endings. Speaking of tragedies, it did bring to mind a subject that I'm sure was already circulating in Jureya's head. I hadn't wanted to mention it just yet, but better now than creating another summer mood later. There were several documents he had lying around, did Sune tell you about them? I asked. Part of the reason she called me back. Very illuminating information. A muscle in his jaw flexed subtly. Okay? That was definitely a hot topic. I told Sensei not to trust him. A man like that could never keep his hands clean. He'll get his. But that's not what I was talking about this letter Orochimaru feared. Possessing the same eyes as a sage. That trait isn't very common is it? Oh. That. Jiraiya seemed to age before my eyes. No. There's only one person who fit that description. He was a redeed. However, unlike this pain figure, red or orange, doesn't really matter. It's the eyes that are important here. Your old student could potentially be alive out there. Alive and capturing Jinchuriki for some reason. I know Naruto. Trust me, I know. One headache removed and another comes up almost immediately. Yeah, may you have interesting times is what the Chinese used to curse people with. All the more reason to find out what is happening in AIM. I knew he would say that. He's not an ordinary shinobi, Jiraiya. Leader of a group of S-Ranks. Rogue S-Ranks. Well, neither am I. Might not be leading notorious rogue ninja. But like you said, legendary Senen. And that's without the aid of Senjutsu. There might be more than one Akatsuki member hanging around there. Okay, enough of this. You don't have to prod me, Naruto. He laughed. I would have suggested you come with me anyways. There is no one else I would want at my back for this. But you realize that we can't just pull our way in for this. AIM has been sealed tight to outsiders for a long time now. So we'll need a plan. And permission naturally. One international escapade might be forgiven too is asking for repercussions. If only they knew the Orochimaru encounter was premediated. Cool. I would have just followed you anyways. I already put some thought into how we can infiltrate. Of course you have. There was a tension in the room. She didn't allow it to affect her outside appearance. Sitting behind her large desk, her shoulders were relaxed, elbows on the flat surface, and fingers steepled in front of her mouth. Her customary resting position, it wouldn't do to appear anything less than calm in front of her soldiers. Another lesson imparted upon her by her late sensei. Her eyes quickly panned the occupants in the office, analyzing their posture and facial expressions for minute tells. Her last teammate and his apprentice stood at ease before her. While closer to the door, waited a Biki Marino and a Nochi Yamanaka. The last two were in the dark as to why she had summoned them which added to the current atmosphere. They would understand soon enough. He's approaching the red zone. Two signatures branched off, stationed at the front entrance. Jiraiya reported, yellow eyes narrowed. The Yamanaka clan head twitched faintly as his own sensor abilities picked up on who the subject was. The only sign that Marino noticed was a quick look from the corner of his eyes. Count as three. Other persons of interest make five. The room was silent as her gaze moved onto the youngest blonde. A moment later and he nodded. Even before that Jiraiya had already started moving, flickering out the window and heading west. The two ambush squads that had been waiting on the roof followed. Moving calmly, Tsunade Senju, fifth hokage of the hidden leaf, stood and made for the door. Her cousin of sorts fell into step behind her in the position her first apprentice would have occupied. Was she a part of this assignment? A head gesture had the two interrogation department members following as well. In that loose formation, she led the way to the designated red zone. The small room reserved for meetings between her and her esteemed advisors, pushy old fools that they were. 
Actual purpose aside, it served well for a detainment having all of the protections that her office did, except for the constant ambiguard detail. As such, when the door was pushed open and then shut behind the party of four, she was certain no one outside would be any wiser as to what had transpired in the room. Of the justice that was to be rendered, it was as if a wind release technique had gone off in the room. The furniture consisting of a low table and four seats, were lying in disarray. In the two furthest corners stood clones of the young blonde, with each restraining an elder with a kunai pinned against their throats. As expected, Kahara and Hamura were not happy, but they could hardly resist. Not when their abilities as shinobi had deteriorated after many years in retirement. As with everyone present, the elders were focused on the center of the room where the unofficial third advisor was positioned. Prone on his stomach, her eyes jumped to the kunai planted through the bandages, and likely into his right eye socket, and then to the cauterized stump of his right arm. She hoped the pain was excruciating. Another clone stood over the scheming elder, with its sandaled foot pressing the side of his face into the ground. In its hand, it held what had captivated everyone, a pasty white arm with several Sharingan eyes embedded into it. It was partially covered with bandages and metal clasps, but enough had been undone to suggest what is beneath. Ignoring the reactions of the rest, her eyes narrowed minutely upon seeing a contorted face on the shoulder of the arm. As expected, Hashirama's cells are quite potent, bonding to the host body without issue yet leaving a mark of its own, a relatively minor issue. The arm is functional and will sustain the various samples. Personal side note, I do wonder how he plans to get their full benefit bereft of an optical nerve as they are. Very curious. But that is not my concern. If he wasn't already dead, she would have done her best to make it his concern. As it was, one culprit was better than none. Treason. Bloodline theft. Sedition. I could go on, but that will do for now. Her words rang in the small room, reflecting none of the emotions she felt inside. The burning rage, disgust, and perhaps a sliver of satisfaction. None could argue her decision regarding this thing anymore. Not without incurring reproach upon that person. Over the heavy breathing of the cripple and the stench of burning flesh, the fifth hokage laid down the verdict. Danzo Shimura, you stand guilty of the highest order. You are to be detained and questioned. But make no mistake, in due time, you will be executed. Yamanaka. Marino, take him away. At once, Lady Hokage. Inochi saluted. The look in Ibiki's eyes gave credence to why many feared being placed in his care. Stepping aside, she watched as the two men went to move the old war hawk. He truly made for a sorry sight with his blood-stained bandages and clothes. Another look at the artificial limb and all feelings of sympathy were washed away. Sune, we deserve dash she silenced Kahari with a spike of intent. Don't think you two are above suspicion. Your fate will be decided in part from what I get out of Danzo. For now, go to your homes and stay there. They wisely didn't protest further. The next day found Sune sitting in her office. Not that there was anything noteworthy about her location. She was certain that by the time Naruto took the damn hat from her, there would be a permanent indentation of her rear in the chair. Who would have thought being a cage would be so unsatisfying? Oh, that's right. She had. Annoying blonde and his persuasive ways. Multi-shadow clone Jutsu wasn't the only Kinjutsu in his arsenal. But she would readily admit the little brat had come a long way. Kishina's blood and the whisker marks added some ambiguity. But she likely wasn't the only one to see a young Minato in him. Especially when he was in a serious mood like right now. She cast a glance at Jiraiya and caught him also watching Naruto pace back and forth with a complicated expression. She could only imagine what thoughts his current student brought to his mind. Probably those about his first two. I'm starting to realize how deep look underneath the underneath actually goes. Naruto stopped for a moment, and then continued trying to put a groove into the floor. I know you said the old man didn't know, but he should at least have had suspicions. Enough to investigate Danzo. Agreed. But do remember that we don't have anything from Sensei's perspective. Unless he left notes behind, all he knew or didn't know about his old friend, went to the grave with him. Personally, she didn't think Saratobi would have found anything. He'd had a habit of seeing the best in those dear to him to an unnatural degree. Even she had gotten away with a number of things due to their closeness. As if thinking along the same line Jiraiya snorted. We all know what Sensei plays above all. His king. Between wiping out a clan or letting the village fall into turmoil, he would prioritize the village above the clan. Perhaps he wouldn't have a kid do the deed like Danzo arranged. But the Achiha would have been subdued in the end. But that only happened because Danzo interfered. It still sounds crazy to me. But Shisui could have ended everything peacefully. Naruto shot back. The village would have been safe and the Achiha pacified. For a man who thinks shinobi shouldn't be led by their emotions, he's a really petty person. He's a hypocrite for sure. However, I think greed is what really drove him. Why let someone else possess such a powerful technique when it could be taken and used in his claim to the Hokage title? Before that temptation, a few hundred lives were of no consequence. He likely saw it as a bonus since it was the Echiha. A powerful technique seemed like an understatement regarding Shisui Shuringan ability. Able to manipulate the mind and suggest commands with a single look or completely subvert one's personality with prolonged exposure. That was what Danzo had been capable of with the eye in his head. 
but she believed the technique could likely do more. Shisui would not have been able to prevent the revolt the Ichiha were committed to, if he had to maintain prolonged eye contact with each person of influence. No, either having the complete set made it more powerful or Shisui had better compatibility with the technique, seeing as it was his. It hadn't been easy getting the information out of the cripple. His paranoia had led to the accumulation of several methods to make a walk through his mind difficult. Not impossible, just difficult. With some helpful seals and Ibiki's aid on the physical front, Inochi had shed some light onto the shinobi of darkness and his exploits. Truly despicable deeds that made her grateful he had never unlocked the full potential of Shisui's eye. She sighed as she listened to the sensei pupil pair converse. Danzo was locked away and would soon be executed. But that was not the end of this chapter. Far from it. When she had first combed through the documents Naruto recovered during his illicit trip, it hadn't taken long to put together the crumbs scattered across numerous texts to realize Orochimaru had a backer inside the village. One in a high position. Subtle investigations and queries later and the suspect had been narrowed down to Danzo. Naruto, when he'd heard, had advocated for a discreet assassination. She'd vetoed that option and instead worked up a plan where the blonde would capture him, and Jiraiya would take a team and capture his root forces. The two sages carried out their tasks flawlessly, and now she had to deal with the fallout from the secrets uncovered, and those whom Danzo used that technique on. It would be for the best to also find out what he programmed them to do. Something that would undoubtedly require time and effort on top of her current duties. She really needed a drink right about now. She could postpone further talk on this subject and drag Naruto and Jiraiya to a bar. Her teammate would cover the tab of course and urgent knocking at the door. Grab the attention of those in the office. A quick second and the extra privacy seals were taken down, while a Kunuchi she was permitted entrance. Her attire labeled her as an agent from the new messenger division. Urgent news, Lady Hokage. She saluted. Tsunade gave her a sign to continue. A patrol squad ran into a monk from the Temple of Fire. They are on the way back now. But Shuriku and everyone else are reported dead. The monk described the killers as two men wearing black cloaks with red clouds. Of course. Rotten luck as always. New plan. Assemble and deploy the Akatsuki Task Force, and then get that drink. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.